Okay, uh, first, for the first 20 minutes, we'll play a few audience games. And uh, the first game is a true or false games game. All those here who are, who have come as a couple, married couple, live-in couple, uh, committed couple, all those who are here as a couple, please stand up. Okay. All those who are sitting separately can also stand up. <laughs> Absolutely, couple is a couple. Okay, this is a true or false game only for you. The problem is this, you have to move as one. Meaning if you think it is right, you have to move together as right. You can't face your backs to each other, right? <laughs> then that disqualifies you as a couple. So true or false, if you think the statement is true, turn to the right. And always, it is men empowerment day. The man, whatever he says, is correct. We, no, I'm just joking, okay? Okay. The social media abbreviation TTC stands for, it's related to obstetrics, stands for trying to copulate. True or false? Social media abbreviation TTC stands for trying to copulate. True or false? Move as one, please. <laughs> it is false. It is trying to conceive. Okay. Knee osteoarthritis affects men more than women. True or false? Affects men more than women. True or false? Men more than women is false, correct. All, all of you got it right. In an intimate relationship or a married relationship, the man typically says, I love you first. It is the man who usually says, this is an evidence-based quiz, okay? <laughs> the man usually says, I love you first. True or false? Apne apne experience ke mutabik hai log. It is true. Man usually says, I love you first. Give a big hand to men. Yeah, see, this is how empowered they are. Devesh ne kuch kaha, us par se ek share yaad aaya. Ke, bade kamal shaks hai ye. Patni pe marte hai. Aur is par hat to ye hai ki apni pe marte hai. False. <laughs> okay. Women can recognize lies better. Women can recognize lies better than men. It is true. Aap log acha hai, lekin aap ke very nice. Men spread more rum rumors than women. Okay, that's right. Affluent women spend one year of their whole lives deciding what to wear. One year of their lives deciding what to wear. Affluent women decide it is true. It is true. Men spend one year of their lives staring at women. <laughs> true or false? <laughs> More than one year? Okay, true. <laughs> okay, you got that right. Men can multitask better than women. Hey, no prompting. <laughs> Men can multitask better than women. It is, it is false. Evidence-based false. Men spend more time in the shower than women. True or false? 
men spend more time true or false are gali desire ko ghumte rehte hain ye shower nahi hai it is false so only three people standing i suppose okay so we will probably have a winner in the last two questions which we have men are more likely to commit suicide true or false men are more likely to commit suicide true or false it is true all three of them got that right and <clears throat> Uh, i'll have to take another quiz class section session the term differently abled replaces disabled true or false differently abled replaces true or false true true is correct and addiction is now called addiction is now called substance abuse disorder true or false addiction now called substance abuse disorder true is not correct it is now called substance use disorder abuse word has been in politically incorrected uh, i think all of you will have to sit down uh, big hand they they have done well <laughs> we'll go ahead with one more quiz as we have some time 2 minutes all those who all those who just now had tea outside not coffee not water tea outside please stand up sirf chai peene wale khade rahe coffee wale nahi chai pe charcha hai yes okay this uh, true or false again is based on terminology both medical and non medical hamari uh, canteen mein jo chai aati hai na teen prakar ki aati hai college ki canteen mein ek bjp ek congress aur ek ncp congress mango to fiki milti hai bjp mango to zyada hi meethi milti hai aur ncp mango to mili juli milti hai ye terms hai hamare mein to ye terminology ka quiz hai climate change is now called climate crisis true or false climate change is now not called climate change it's called climate crisis true or false right true left false it is true crisis because they want to denote some urgency in the climate change scenario in airports restaurants etc the handicapped restroom is called the physically challenged restroom true or false handicapped restroom is called physically challenged restroom sir aap 45 degrees <laughs> left okay okay uh, so we have a winner it is called accessible restroom i think sir one give him a prize that uh, सर आपका नाम बताएंगे प्रवीण जैन सर के लिए तालियां फिर से हो जाए बीसीओ में एक थे एंड नाउ वी प्ले बिंगो वी वुड लाइक द टू टीम्स कुमार विल यू अनाउंस द नेम्स ऑफ द टीम्स फॉर मी हैव यू गिवन मी द नेम्स ओके सो टुडेज प्रोग्राम इज दिस first we are playing a game which is a stage quiz plus bingo please give bingo tickets to everybody please give bingo tickets to everybody so stage quiz khelenge aur sath sath mein simultaneously bingo hoga you will be told which word to strike out as we ask questions may i invite invite the first two teams there will be two bingo sessions one before Dr. Maniya's lecture. One after Dr. Maniya's lecture, we'll be covering about 50 to 60 topics in the bingo, and the first group will please come on stage. Dr. Devesh Desai, 
डॉक्टर अजिता भोसले डॉक्टर विक्रांत पवार इज वन टीम डॉक्टर पंकज मेहता डॉक्टर रीना मेहता एंड डॉक्टर विभाकर अद्वरियू विल यू प्लीज कम ऑन स्टेज He is replacing Dr. Vikrant Pawar because Vikrant Pawar sir is not here. Acha, he is here. I am so sorry. Pankaj, I am not here. Jagdish is not here. Ah. So, so Jagdish Shah, ke badle, Dr. Adwariu. Sir, please come here. This side. Come, come, come. Uh, we will have to take away your bingo tickets because those are clues to the answers. So I will just take it here. Usme answer hai. So, I'll just explain the game to you or uh, actually Tushar will be able to explain better than me. Hi, good morning. So we have two teams here. Uh, Special, special attention to the teams. We will show you the grid. Rachita, can we have the grid? Yeah, can you see the grid? So you can see on your left hand side vertically, it says easy, easy, moderate, moderate, and tough. That is the level of difficulty for the questions and your rewards are for the risks that you take. So easy will give you, each set will give you, will have to answer two questions. If both are correct, you get 10 marks. If one right, one wrong, you get zero. If it is both are negative, both are wrong, you get minus five. If you select moderate, the reward is of 20 points for two correct. Again, one right, one wrong cancels each other and you get no marks. If it is, if both are negative, you get minus 10 marks. And finally, the tough category, if you choose, you will be rewarded with, and you answer both the questions, you will be rewarded with 30 points. Again, one right, one wrong, no marks. And both negative, you get minus 15 marks. On the top, if you see, these are the categories. So we give you a give you a hint on what type of questions they are going to be. So first one says versus. That Dr. Tushasha will explain to you. New term means there are new terminologies which have been introduced. Some questions related to trials, repurposed drugs. It's going to be a mixed bag. Then there is a column on pediatric questions. There are spotters in the next two and there is dermatology or skin related questions in the last two. So you need to choose one. So for example, one of you can say B3 and we'll open the question B3 for you. As far as the audience is concerned, whatever answer comes, that you can mark it on your bingo ticket if it is present. And so you will be playing a simultaneous bingo when there's a jeopardy going on over here, all right? And we will throw you some FAQs, as we like to say, frequent audience questions. And you will also get points and marks for that. So if you fare better than them, good for you. Yeah, Tushar, over to Tushar. Sorry? No, so when you open, suppose you said B4, that B4 will get covered then you can't obviously ask for B4 again because you have attempted it once. So neither team can ask for it. We are not keeping a pass on. The pass on will go to the audience. Okay? And for every pass on, audience will get 10 marks. If audience doesn't answer, audience doesn't get any negative marks. Or so excuse me, can we have a trial question? Just sure, to get we the can format? have a trial question. Uh, so choose any topic, but we'll not open the... Where is Rachita? 
You will not open, but choose any topic, and I'll give you an example of what the questions will be like. Ch choose any. Mixed bag. Mixed bag. So, no, so the mixed bag will open. Easy, moderate, or tough. Yeah. You give me easy, moderate, or tough. So you need to tell us C the nine. coordinates. C9. Right? So, no, so, so it, what you have to say is C9, right? C9, perfect. OK, so the tough question, there will be two answers, I mean, two questions asked, 15 marks each, right? So your tough question is, which eye disease is worsened by uh, semaglutide? Incorrect. The next question. Anybody? The proliferative diabetic proliferative not trend is worse. It. So that if you get that correct, you now have 15 points. And then the second question is, which is a major side effect of semaglutide other than pancreatitis or any cancer, which can cause severe abdominal pain? Yeah, paralytic Remember, ileus, this is a tough category, right? That's why it's taking so time just, for people to answer. making a random answer. question up, but this is the kind of tough questions you will get. After I ask two tough questions to them, and we give them points, I will be asking audience a question, right? And audience ke liye negative to nahi hai, lekin audience ke liye multiple answers are also allowed. So you can shout out your answers, and the correct one will be picked. Okay, so uh, we will start the we'll start the quiz. Chahiye na, lights. Those the lights full kar denge, audience mein. Thoda sa screen kam dekhega. But it should be OK. I think it will be visible. If any part of the audience can't see through me, which is likely, then you <laughs> can sit a little medially, if possible. We have no timer, but we will try to have lunch early. Meaning match here. OK, uh, we'll start with team A. Please choose. C1. C1. C1, easy, moderate, difficult. You'll have to... C1, C1 is, easy. is easy. I'm so sorry. C1 is a mixed bag, and the question is, what is the full form of SIBO? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Is five points to... We'll be giving hands to them. And small, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is correct. Give me the two prominent symptoms of SIBO. The two prominent symptoms. Abdominal bloating and constipation are associated with diarrhea sometimes. Diarrhea. I will not, I'll give it to you, but it is diarrhea. Diarrhea, it's not like IBS. It is diarrhea with bloating is correct. Ten points to... Uh, team A. Audience so, so this is the answer, right? Sorry. Just for the audience to see, and you will have to mark it on your bingo, whoever has the answer. SIBO will be there. SIBO will be as an answer. We'll tell you every time what is the word which you may find on your bingo ticket. No. No, no, only SIBO. Every time, one word will be there. Hello, here it is SIBO. You can give me the words as, as we finish, right? For the audience, there is a breath test done as a confirmation of SIBO. Do you know the breath test? What is it called? Urea. Urea, nahin. Urea hota hai. Gas test. H is for hydrogen. Hydrogen breath test is the test done for SIBO. If you suspect, uh, suspect SIBO, when, you, when, when will you suspect patient comes with bloating, diarrhea, which is long standing? You give some antibiotic, patient gets better. Again, patient comes after a few days with bloating, diarrhea. You have, to, you can do a breath test done only at Hinduja, PD Hinduja Mahim. And that breath test, basically they give a carbohydrate like, like lactulose and the bacteria which is in the overgrowth area produces hydrogen immediately and causes a rapid detection of hydrogen in the breath. And that breath test confirms. Many people don't confirm the diagnosis by the, on the symptoms. They give an empiric course. What is the drug of choice? Rifaximin. Rifaximin 550 TDS for 14 days 
is given if you suspect clinically SIBO or prove SIBO by the hydrogen breath test. Okay, that finishes one question. Team B, your question, choice please. C3. C3. Mixed bag. Easy. Um, slide, please. Uh, what, with respect to the treatment of anemia, especially in CKD, what is the full form of ESA? Erythropoietin uh, supporting anemia. Incorrect. Audience? Audience, ESA? Erythropoiesis stimulating agents, ESA. Your next question. What is the preferred route of administration of erythropoietin in patients on dialysis? How are they given erythropoietin? IV or oral? IV or, sorry, subcute. Subcutaneous. Please let them answer. Subcutaneous is incorrect. In patients on dialysis, it is usually given IV. In patients not on dialysis, it is usually given subcute. So, so minus five to team A, and your uh, your housey ticket is ESA. Audience question: A short-acting erythropoietin is called erythropoietin alpha. What is the long-acting called? There is another ESA which is long acting. Sorry? Darbe poetin. Darbe poetin. You must know this well because patients probably will take injections from you. So, erythropoietin injections typically are given three times a week. Darbe poetin injections can be given once in 15 to once in 30 days. Okay? And another important thing to realize as Physicians, what you will have to monitor is do not let hemoglobin go above 11 on erythropoietin because it increases the chances of stroke. So your target is 11. At 11, you have to stop the erythropoietin for some time. Let the hemoglobin fall back to 10 or below and then restart erythropoietin. Another important message here is that you can't give erythropoietin before you have replenished iron. Your, your ferritin level should be more than 200 before you consider giving erythropoietin. More than 100, I'm so sorry, more than 100. Okay. Uh, who are going to play in the next round? Not yet completely decided. I would prefer that they give their bingo tickets back to us so that they don't get double price. <laughs> uh, actually, we need those bingo tickets. Uh, but we, we don't have certainty. Tickets. But can, those who are definitely volunteer? playing, can you, can some, uh, those people we who have three people part? who have volunteered. Dr. Sheila Rathod, Dr. Dr. Haan. Uh, can I have your bingo tickets, please? Uh, Kumar, chin le. <laughs> and I was requesting Dr. Gwalani to play No, no, don't give the them bingo. back, please. No, 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 take it back, take it back, take it back. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Take it back, please. Please. Dr. Gwalani, will you be playing? Anyone else Nain, playing? Unka gala hai. Thank you. Anybody else would like to play bingo next round? Please raise your hand. Dr. Bagadia. There are assured gifts if you uh, come on the stage. Dr. Bagadia, udar se le lo. Thank you. Can you hand over your Aur bingo pe tickets, kisi please? And if possible, stay away from people who have bingo tickets. It's infectious. Bhai, aaj, aaj wo kaam nahi ho raha. Mara male empowerment nahi ho para. Any males? Any males willing to play? I would request all of you to sit in the first row if you can. Those who are going to participate in the next one. Sir, go bingo ticket. All those who don't have bingo tickets and are not going to take part in second round, please make sure you have a ticket with you. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Uh, the four words that have gone so far, can you just tell? SIBO and ESA. In what time? Okay. 
we our purpose of course is this quiz this game with the audience but more importantly also our purpose is to learn so if possible uh, keep uh, writing notes if you are into writing notes or of course we will be pushing this on youtube and you can rewatch it uh, we do know that nobody rewatches raat gayi baat gayi okay uh, team a your choice g2 c2, c2. सी टू आपका है सर सी टू पीरियडिक्स सी टू सो इफ यू सी दिस इमेज प्लीज टेल मी आफ्टर हाउ मेनी सेंटीमीटर्स ऑफ इंटर मेल्यूलर डिस्टेंस दैट शोन विद द एरो वुड यू कॉल इट पैथोलॉजिकल नॉकनीस मीनिंग बियॉन्ड हाउ मेनी सेंटीमीटर्स वुड यू कॉल इट पैथोलॉजिकल नॉकनीस Eighteen centimeters. Okay, it's incorrect. The correct answer is eight centimeters. Yeah, we did a we did a bit of mentimeter, and the answer was leaked earlier. This is just to know how many of you actually attempted on that. The second question is: This we are talking about knock knees. If we were talking about bow legs, we would measure it at the intercondylar distance, that is, in at the knee level. What would be the distance there to call it pathological bow legs? Centimeters. That centi is six centimeters. So bow legs beyond six centimeters, you considered pathological. Knock knees, you consider beyond eight centimeter. So audience question: What? Easy, nee tha. Sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought it was easy because it was leaked in the mentimeter earlier. That was the only reason. Uh, lower limbs should be measured in. which position while measuring this distances so what care you have to take when you take these measurements audience question standing, standing very good what else not standing, not standing on the toes so weight bearing both knee both legs but if you see carefully here the the patella of both the knees should be facing forward mm -hmm. right because with knock knees and bow legs they would tend to either stand in out toeing or in toeing so you need to make sure the patella is in patella patella is both patella are facing forward and then take your measurements i think 8 cm 8 cm is the bingo answer bingo ticket pe 8 cm likha hai okay team b your question do decide beforehand so that we can make it fast d3 d3 so he said d3 d3 okay d3 we are showing only the image here what is your radiologic diagnosis yes under the diagram no prompting please gas under the right dome of the diaphragm suggest you uh, perforated viscous gas under the diaphragm it is both domes of diaphragm gas under both domes of diaphragm is correct your second question what is the commonest non traumatic cause of a perforated viscous commonest non traumatic cause of perforated viscous peptic ulcer peptic ulcer i'll give it to you duodenal ulcer specifically is the most common cause of an audience question what is the commonest cause of duodenal ulcer and said is the commonest cause of what's the ulcer. bingo word the gas. bingo word is gas gas and the diaphragm okay that is your 10 points to team b team a choose D one spot diagnosis image only identify the pathology. Sorry, there is there this is a question there. There is a question there. 
The X-ray shows a pathology that chiefly occurs in infants and if untreated can be fatal. It is, it is, uh, yeah, it is a cause of intestinal obstruction. Shh. It's on, it's on. It's on. Uh, please speak into the mic so that I know your mic is working. Intussusception. Is correct. Intussusception for five points is correct. Your second question. What is the classic description of stool which tells the family physician that the diagnosis is intussusception in a patient with pain and vomiting? Something current jelly, red. Current uh, jelly, uh, stool is correct. Excellent. Just a word of... Uh, just a word of caution here. As a family physician or a pediatrician, don't wait for the current jelly stools to happen. If you see a child who is vomiting and not passing loose motions, has abdominal distension, is either too quiet or excessively crying, please consider intersusception at the earliest and get a sonograph written. Current jelly comes a little later. And the other tidbits are that to differentiate a dysentery from current jelly jewel stools, uh, dysentery will have stool mixed with blood, whereas in currant jelly or red currant jelly, it will be a blood with mucus and sloughing of mucosa, but hardly or no stool matter. Sir, on, sir, on PR, the uh, intersusception is felt on PR. When PR intersusception is not felt because it is a, usually a ileoileal or ileocecal. Intersusception is the word on your tickets. Bingo word. So 10 points, full points to team A there. Next. Team B. E3. E3. E3 is a section of dermatology. Uh, E3 is yours. E3 is mine. What is the diagnosis? Molluscum contagiosum. Excellent. Molluscum contagiosum. Correct. Very good. Excellent. So name a viral con Yes, yes. Yeah. Name a viral infection. So molluscum contagiosum has papules with umbilication. Name a viral infection that has vesicles with umbilication. Uh, chicken pox. Excellent. Very nice. So full marks to them. Ten points to team B. Molluscum. Molluscum. Audience question quickly. Which period in a pregnant lady is most likely to cause severe neonatal chicken pox? I'm not talking about chicken pox embryopathy. Severe neonatal chicken pox. So I'm saying severe neonatal chicken pox as in the child would be born With and rash. they would deliver, ha have a rash and varicella infection. Yeah, so it's the critical period is five days before delivery or two days after delivery. If the mother gets vesicular rash of chicken pox, child can have severe neonatal chicken pox infection. Thank you. Time. The word is? Molluscum. molluscum. D2. D2. D2 is spot diagnosis, only image. Please show the image. Identify the lesion. No answers from the audience, please. This is an easy question again. Identify the lesion. Cutaneous lesion. Which area it is, he's asking, sir, Cutaneous. on the body? Carbuncle. Carbuncle is the correct answer. Five points for carbuncle. What is the commonest organism responsible? Staphylococcus. Or yes. Or yes. Staph or yes is the correct answer. Ten points for that. And yes, audience, carbuncle is your word. Yeah. And your audience question, difficult question for ten points for the audience. Which patients are advised intranasal mupirocin and chlorhexidine baths for five days? Which patients? are advised five days of chlorhexidine baths and mupirocin intranasally. Undergoing TKR is a good answer. Patients who are undergoing major surgeries, including TKR, hip replacement, CABG, valve replacement in the heart, 
they are advised five days of this to prevent post-operative or hospital-acquired staphylococcal infection. This is very important for the GP. You have so many patients going for TKR, and if some hospitals do not have the regulation of doing this, you must insist on this. Ideally, you'd have to take a nasal swab first, check the presence of Staph aureus, and if Staph aureus is present, this is definitely done. If you can't check for Staph aureus, do this anyway, it does not harm. Okay, that is 10 points for team A. Team B. D5. D5. Spot diagnosis again. What is the disease or lesion? Marked by the arrow. This is a CT scan of the lungs. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is the correct answer. Plus 5 to plus team 10. B. Plus 10. Sorry, plus, plus 10. This is a moderate. moderate sorry. Yeah. The moderate level difficulty plus 10 to you. Your second question. What is the typical age and body habitus, body shape or habitus, of a patient with primary spontaneous pneumothorax? Tall, young Tall, boy. young. Okay, absolutely we'll correct. It. 10 absolutely points to you. Tall, thin, adolescent is the correct so answer. So total 20 points for this 20 question. 20 points and the answer on your tickets is pneumothorax. Okay, very quick on the, if a young tall person, you know, almost marfanoid, but young tall thin person comes to you with acute pleuritic pain in the chest and a patient has inspiratory aggravation of pain or cough aggravating pain, which is pleuritic, then you must think of uh, pneumothorax. Small pneumothorax can be missed on x-ray. So if you don't see a pneumothorax on the x-ray and still suspect it, ask the radiologist to take an x-ray chest in full expiration. full expiration. Normally they take in full inspiration. So always advise x-ray chest in full expiration to look for pneumothorax. When you take in full expiration, diaphragm goes up, the pneumothorax becomes more apparent. So a small pneumothorax will not be missed. And if it's the largest pneumothorax occupying more than 50% of the, uh, of the uh, half lung, then you may have to put an ICD or drain. If it's a tension pneumothorax, you may have to urgently treat with a needle put in the second intercostal space. What size needle? 18, 18 19 needle. And this needle goes in the second space, and you can, in a pneumothorax, where the uh, lung is showing a large pneumothorax, you can, as a family physician, save the person if the person has tension pneumothorax, meaning patient has hypotension, hypoxia. This is called a tension pneumothorax. You must do it in your clinic and then send the patient home. Just put a needle there, let it, uh, uh, let the air come out. Don't need to put any pipe or anything with the needle and send the patient to the hospital. So this is 10 points. 20, more, 20, 20 points. points to team B. Team A. D4. D4. Spot diagnosis. See the image and diagnose. Identify the disease. Endometriosis. Endometriosis for uh, five points. Endometriosis is the uh, word on your ticket. Endometriosis. The uh, question is. Word is endo. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Endo. State one GI symptom caused by endometriosis. GI symptom. GI symptom caused by endometriosis. Take the mic. Diarrhea. Diarrhea is accepted. Cyclic diarrhea or cyclic tenesmus can be caused. So you know that endometriosis is deposition of endometrial tissue outside the endometrium in the uterus. So uh, the principal symptom of endometriosis, please remember, is secondary, meno uh, secondary dysmenorrhea, meaning patient from menarche does not have dysmenorrhea. The dysmenorrhea started after some time of menarche. And this secondary dysmenorrhea can be associated with other system involvement. For example, they can get endometriosis of the urinary tract causing hematuria, cyclic hematuria, cyclic diarrhea, Cyclic tenesmus are peculiar symptoms, dyspironia, peculiar symptoms of endometriosis. 
10 okay. points. 10 points to team A. Team B? D6. D6. Spot diagnosis. What is that thing? Grayish thing that you can see. It can be placed within or outside the underpants. What? This is moderate, so 10 points. What do you think that is? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It is a charcoal based object. What is it for? Okay, audience? Yes, yes, yes. So, sir. Well, uh, audience has been. So, this is a charcoal based undergarment padding to absorb the flatus to avoid embarrassment in public situations. Yeah, this is available on Amazon. Name your second question. There are two typical symptomatic drugs for flatulence. One drug is contained in uni enzyme tablets. What drug is contained in uni enzyme? Which is for flatulence? Activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is the correct answer. Big hand. And we therefore give you plus 15, minus 15, zero. No points for this round. I said platus. You said platus. You said plus 10, minus 10. So final answer is zero. You said platus? Okay, I'm so sorry. I thought it was prompted from there. But okay, then they get they plus said, 30. So get plus plus 30 20. Then. Sorry, plus 20. Moderate, I'm so sorry. Plus 20 to you. Audience, your question. The, Some. What is the word on bingo? Sorry, just one second. Charcoal, charcoal. is the word on bingo. Audience, do you, can you tell me if uh, non-vegetarian food causes more flatus or vegetarian? Vegetarian. Yeah. And can you tell me two different vegetables of different groups which can cause flatus formation? So one family is the Brassicaceae or the uh, Cruciferaceae family, that is broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, radish, etc. One more outside that family. Vegetable, vegetable, vegetable. Sorry? Potato, no. Potato, no. Not Beans. Beans are not vegetables, no? Nah? Onion, excellent. Onions and carrots are two very important flatulence causing vegetables. So when we advise our patient, because we don't have much to treat by way of treatment for patients, so we can ad advise some food avoidance, like we advise food avoidance in IB IBS, for example. The food avoidance here will be the cruciferacy group. This is also called the brassicaceae group of cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, etc. And onions, carrots are flatulence producing vegetables. And the others you know, pulses and things like that. Okay. And one more symptomatic drug used in flatulence is? Cymethicon. Cymethicon. That is methyl polysiloxane which you get in Jellucil MPS, for example, methyl polysiloxan. It is available standalone also. Dimol. Dimol. Tablets, 40 milligram tablets are available standalone. OK. Can, uh, team A. A3. A3. Charcoal was the bingo word. A3. Now this whole section, this whole section is called verses. Verses, we will be prompting with one word and you have to tell us, the team has to tell us what this word is compared with most commonly, right? So if this is SGOT, team A, what is the most compared thing to SGOT? Use the mic, please. Word. So you say A versus what B. Word? A versus B. Huh. What is the most comparable thing? Condition or the other enzyme? What, what condition will you do with SGOT, which is versus this, comparing this with this? You can't compare SGOT huh. with alcohol. We, you are right, we, you can come. Yeah, <laughs> we compare no this with SGPT in alcohol. This thing, because this more. SGPT is correct. So you are comparing this, this with this, right? So your answer is correct. Five points to 
SGPT, which is also on your tickets. Your question. SGOT is on ticket. SGOT on ticket. I'm so sorry. SGOT on ticket. Your question. In which cause of al acute hepatitis is SGOT SGPT ratio 2 is to 1 or more and SGOT is below 500 always or almost always? SGOT never goes above 500 and the SGOT SGPT ratio remains 2 is to 1 or more. SGOT greater than SGPT in which acute hepatitis. Alcoholic hepatitis. Acute alcoholic hepatitis is correct. Uh, 10 marks total to team A. Very quickly. Uh, acute alcoholic hepatitis is very important to know. If a patient comes with acute hepatitis, jaundice, and if the SGOT, SGPT, SGPT is more than SGOT, often it is viral hepatitis. And if the patient has, and bilirubin of course is elevated. And if the patient has SGOT greater than SGPT with a ceiling of 500 for the SGOT, then think of alcoholic hepatitis. Similarly, in malaria, dengue, typhoid, you know that in audience, SGOT greater than SGPT in which? In dengue. Dengue, SGOT is higher than SGPT. So in acute fever, where the bilirubin is normal, and SGOT PT are high. Think of dengue when SGOT is more than SGPT. Think of malaria or typhoid when SGPT is more than SGOT. And in typhoid, SGOT PT can be higher than malaria's elevation. So highest SGOT PT in typhoid than in dengue. And if any of these diseases of acute fever have severe dehydration, then there is an overlap of ischemic hepatitis, and then you can get 1,000 SGOTPT also in these diseases. Okay. Also, in pediatrics, if you see jaundice with SGOT more than SGPT, especially in a vaccinated child, think about Wilson's disease. Their SGOT is higher than SGPT. Also, in chronic active hepatitis, you can have SGOT higher than SGPT. So 10 points there. Team A. Team B. A5. A5. You have chosen moderate again. And again, you have to compare, right? What is the answer there? Levofloxacin. What is the closest comparable thing to levofloxacin? What would you compare it with? Moxifloxacin. Moxifloxacin for 10 points there. Well done. Levofloxacin versus moxifloxacin. Both are used in MDRTB. Which organ infection will respond to levofloxacin but not respond to moxifloxacin? Which organ infection will respond to levo but not respond to moxi? Urinary tract infection. Wonderful. 15 points for urinary tract infection. <laughs> levofloxacin does not ex is not excreted in the urine. For the audience, 20, which, 20 marks. which potentially fatal ADR is more likely with moxifloxacin than with levofloxacin, adverse drug reaction, potentially fatal. Which is more likely with moxie? <laughs> QT prolongation. QT prolongation and cardiac tachyarrhythmia is more uh, likely. Seizures are likely with both, but QT prolongation more likely with moxifloxacin. Okay. And since both these drugs are now used in MDR-TB, we should definitely not use levofloxacin for the previous indications of pneumonia or sinusitis, etc. Bingo word is the same as levofloxacin. levofloxacin. Okay, team A. A7. A7. He's gone for moderate and this is versus. Transfer in saturation will be most commonly compared to what? TSAT will be most commonly compared to what? Serum ferritin. Is correct. 15 points for serum ferritin. Ten, well done. 10 marks for... 10 points, I'm sorry. 10 points for... So, uh, for the audience, TSAT and serum ferritin are two important investigations for 
and deficient anemia proof. Your second question. When will TSAT be better than ferritin as a test for iron deficiency anemia? When will it be better than ferritin as a test for iron deficiency anemia? If a person is having some secondary infection, then ferritin might be higher because of some inflammation. But Wonderful. Absolutely. Whenever there is an inflammatory state or infection, ferritin will not be able to detect iron deficiency because ferritin will be falsely elevated in any infection. So TSAT will be a better. So just to get the basics right, when you are asking for iron levels for a suspected iron deficiency anemia, if the patient is suffering from even a common cold or dengue or any chronic rheumatoid arthritis like disease, don't send for ferritin. You send for iron study, you write down serum iron studies without ferritin. That serum iron studies will give you serum iron levels, total iron binding capacity and transferrin saturation. Transferrin saturation is the amount of iron on the protein. Transferrin saturation below 20 is considered low. So that value will give, a, give you an idea whether the serum iron is low. Remembering that ferritin is the most sensitive test, meaning if there is iron deficiency anemia, ferritin will pick it up first and not... So if the patient does not have inflammatory disorder, and if you want to order only one thing, then you order serum ferritin. Okay. Bingo word. Bingo word. Transferrin. T sad like hai ki transferrin situation like hai? Transferrin. One second. You uh, announce the bingo word every time. Uh, achha, so I keep them. You keep the mic with you. Okay, so while you all are marking the words on your bingo tickets, uh, the prizes up for grabs are the three lines. There is a Jaldi 5 and there are two full houses. So if anyone has any claims, do. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, Jaldi 5 has just been changed to Jaldi 6. <laughs> <laughs> Jaldi 6 also. Only, only one claim game. for Jaldi 6? Yes. Okay. Jaldi, Jaldi 6. 6. Uh, late 6 but still okay. Can you just speak the word, sir? Aap pehle? Yes, correct. Aapka, sir? Mipurosin nahi hai, na? Nahi hai. Sir, so we have one prize winner there. Uh, Talia? Rasalkar sir ne aapko ek mupirosin ka hint de diya hai. <laughs> okay, kiska done hai? Yeah, big hand. Sir, aapka naam batayenge? Sir, aapka naam batayenge? Rashmikant Sangvi. Rajnikant Sangvi. Congratulations. And uh, now we have first line, second line, third line, first full house, second full house. These are the prizes that uh, I forgot to announce. Whose turn? Team B, choose. E5. 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 E5 is okay. Hai. Name the viral, name a viral infection or name the viral infection in toddlers that may lead to this condition. As a sequelae, usually after four weeks of infection, you see these changes. common in toddlers, nurse, nursery or young kids. Foot, uh, mama, hand, hand, foot, mouth. Syndrome. Hand, foot, mouth disease is the correct answer. So usually after four to eight weeks, sometimes you have all the nails peeling off, which is the rare but dreaded complications of, complication of hand, foot, mouth disease. This is okay. This is not a dreaded complication. Myocarditis. Excellent. Wonderful. So, myocarditis, myocarditis, encephalitis, or aseptic meningitis. These are some of the rare but dreaded complications of hand, foot, mouth disease. Can the audience name one parasitic infection which also gives rise to papules on the palm and soles, like hand, foot, mouth disease has papules? Scabies. Scabies is right. Thank you. The bingo word is HFM. Okay. 
नेक्स्ट पॉइंट्स टू डी सेवन डी सेवन डी सेवन डी सेवन हो गया सर नहीं 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 सी दी एक्स एक्सर प्लीज विच पैरासिटिक इन्फेक्शन विल कॉज अ रेडियोलॉजिक पिक्चर लाइक दिस विच पैरासिटिक इन्फेक्शन सर इट्स बिकॉज ऑफ सर हाइड्रेट आई मीन अमेबिक क्रिपेटाइट इज कॉजिंग द यू वॉन्ट इज हिस्टोलिटिका वॉट द कंडीशन आई मीन दिस इज नेम You are right. Yeah, amoebic liver. Amoebic liver abscess, yeah, not hydatid cyst. Amoebic liver abscess or amoebic liver disease. The correct answer. Big hand to Dr. Devesh's team. So this is the right dome elevation of right dome. Hi, sir. Big hand to sir. Dr. Maniar has come. <laughs> sir, what is your tolerance for internal medicine? <laughs> Very good. Okay. <laughs> okay uh so this the answer is amoebic liver abscess and the second question this is basically the raised dome of diaphragm pushing pushed up by the amoebic liver abscess right amoebic liver abscess usually occurs on the superior surface of the right lobe of the liver so this is a classic uh, uh, there are many causes of raised right dome but this one is a classic cause any fever with rigor patient comes to you and you find some right lower zone crepts or pleural rub and you think of pneumonia and you get this x-ray then you know that this is probably an amoebic liver abscess and you will get an ultrasound done question 2 to uh team a team a if a person presents with elevation of left dome of diaphragm after a cabg surgery what is the cause of elevation of the left dome of diaphragm after bypass surgery again something that you will detect a patient often will come saying that they are feeling breathless and you do the x ray and they will show a left dome raised after a bypass surgery after coming home answer please quickly pneumoperitoneum pneumoperitoneum pushing up the no anybody phrenic uh, nerve palsy is the answer coming from phrenic nerve phrenic nerve palsy because of injury during surgery as a complication of or iatrogenic uh, complication of surgery is correct so uh, important to remember for small babies if they come with a diaphragm which is not in its usual place you think about either a diaphragmatic hernia you think about eventration of diaphragm or also commonly with birth injuries causing brachial plexus injuries one can have phrenic nerve injury and you can have a diaphragm which is pulled up the bingo word dome and uh, no points to team a zero right on team this. b e6 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 is with me uh here is a picture you have to just identify the skin lesion name the skin lesion no prompting from the audience please yeah on the mic please erythema nodosum is the correct answer erythema nodosum is the correct answer this is a moderately difficult area so we are going to ask you a question which is a little difficult which drug used in rheumatology is also used to treat the painful erythema nodosum drugs excluding steroids and nsaids which other rheumatologic drug can relieve pain of erythema nodosum aspirin aspirin mein nsaid aa gaya na nsaid nahi steroid nahi penicillin anybody colchicin is the correct answer colchicin 0.5 mg once a day is given for erythematosum which has not responded or where you can't give ensels or steroids for renal or diabetes reasons you give colchicin 0.5 od for several weeks or months 
to the audience, which is the commonest bacterium causing erythema nodosum? Not tuberculosis. Not lepto. Streptococcal pharyngeal infection, throat infection, is the commonest infection associated with erythema nodosum. Yeah? Beta hemolytic streptococci. So they get no marks for this question. They get no marks for not answering colchicine. We will have the scores, please. Bingo ticket. Team A, 65. Erythema nodosum. Team B, 95. I don't know what is on the tickets. Isme colchicine nahi hai. Erythema nodosum is the answer. En nahi na? Colchicine is yet to come. Don't worry. Sorry? First line? Colchicine nahi hai. Ye colchicine ka alag question aega baad mein. En, erythema nodosum has been abbreviated to En on your bingo ticket. Tumar was bingo ticket nahi hai. That is, isme En nahi likha hai. Okay. Aapke paas kya En hai? Okay. En is the correct answer. Somebody will have to manage this. Give me the correct answers, please, as soon as the question ends. Okay. That is erythema nodosum. And what is the scores, please? Team A 65. Team A 65. Team B 95. And since the, we have given Dr. Maniar 10.30, I will excuse us for 15 more minutes. Chalega? Okay. Next question, uh, team A. C5. Team A, C5, mixed bag, moderate uh, level difficulty. For 10 points. In traveler's diarrhea, antibiotics are to be used only if fever, Rachita, C5. bloody diarrhea, or prolonged infection occurs. Which antibiotic is given as a single dose orally in such cases of traveler's diarrhea. Which antibiotic given as single dose? Give us the dose and the antibiotic. Answer please. Rifaximin sir. Single dose rifaximin, no? Anybody? Azithromycin, single dose mein azithromycin aega. Dose, one gram single dose of azithromycin is the correct answer. Second question. Remember in traveler's diarrhea, previously we used to give prophylaxis very regularly. Now prophylaxis is not usually given unless a patient has had diarrhea in that same location before or has proneness to diarrhea multiple times. So if you do give prophylaxis, one of the uh, favorite drugs for prophylaxis is rifaximin. But your question is, which preventive drug is used in a dose of two tablets four times a day? Eight tablets per day. Which drug is used in such uh, such a for traveler's diarrhea? Prophylaxis. Which drug? Okay, I don't think they will. Uh, good, you cool though. Two tablets, four times a day. Anybody in the audience? Bismuth is the correct answer. She got it right. Bismuth is the correct answer. Bismuth subcitrate or bismuth subsalicylate are given. Bismuth is a drug which is a preventive drug or it can be used as a symptomatic drug. Bismuth typically is used for H. pylori as a fourth drug, but it can be used here. For the audience, which causative organism of of traveler's diarrhea is most likely to lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome. Campylobacter jejuni. This we discussed first time. Also, Campylobacter jejuni. Now, this is very important. How many of you have been to Thailand? How many of you propose to go to Thailand soon? <laughs> A few people propose to go to Thailand soon? Huh? No, 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 no. I'll give you azithromycin tablets. <laughs> so, basically, basically, South Asia has a lot of Campylobacter jejuni, which is resistant to doxycycline or penicillins or ciproquinolones. So, these 
areas, if you get traveler's diarrhea, please carry azithromycin with you when you go there so that uh, you can take it if necessary. Otherwise, there is a small chance that after two, three weeks of returning back, you will end up with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Bingo, Bingo word is diarrhea. Team B. Sorry? Bingo Somebody tickets. Somebody wants bingo tickets. Haan. Somebody wants bingo tickets. Please take bingo ticket. And when we take a break, we will give you the we will give you the answers done so far in the break. Okay. The plan is we stop the bingo this first session at 10:30. Declare winners, and then we don't go out for the break. We have one session per one hour. 11:30 we have our tea break. Okay. Uh, team B. B. A9. A9, A9, A9. They are being very brave. They want to kind of give See them it. a good chance. Na? Okay. Your molecule, moxonidin, is written here. What is the closest comparison to moxonidin? What drug will moxonidin be compared with? Perfenadine. Can you put it on the mic? Perfenadine. Perfenadine is incorrect. Anybody? Clonidine. Moxonidin is the antihypertensive. And perfenidone is not, it's an antifibrotic drug for IPF. But you will get a second question so that you don't land up with minus points. State the side effect which is less common with moxonidine but more common with clonidine. Which side effect uh, makes moxonidine a better drug? Posterior hypotension. Posterior hypotension is incorrect. Anybody? Dry mouth. Dry mouth is the correct answer. So they get minus 15. Correct? Minus 15. Minus 15. That's right. Okay. Audience, rebound hypertension occurs on stopping. For us, family physicians, very important to realize that moxonidine and clonidine both cause postural hypertension like many other antihypertensive drugs. If a patient comes with postural hypertension and is on four or five drugs, remember that moxonidine, clonidine and beta blockers cannot be stopped suddenly. These are the two groups of drugs which if you stop will cause rebound hypertension and maybe stroke. So try to stop amlodipine, tell me certain, etc. before you try to stop. But, but you can reduce gradually if you are reducing. Okay. Bingo word is moxinidine. The spelling is incorrect but the word is correct. Moxonidine is the correct word. Okay, we will have one more round. Team A. A1, A sir. A1, um, uh, easy. Can you have that? What do you compare amylase most with? Lipase. Lipase is the correct answer for five points. Your second question. Both amylase and lipase become abnormal in acute pancreatitis within 24 hours. Maybe four to six hours also, but within 24 hours. Which of these two enzymes lasts longer as abnormal in the bloodstream? Lipase. Lipase is the correct answer. Lipase lasts longer. So basically, if a patient comes with acute pain uh, but has already lapsed five days, nickel gaye hain, amylase may come normal, then lipase will be abnormal till 14 days. So that is what you can do. Audience question. Uh, which viral infection can cause increase in amylase but not in lipase? Which viral infection causes high lipase? Amylase? Yes, you got it right. Mumps. Mumps is the correct answer. Mumps uh, will cause high amylase because of salivary amylase but not lipase. But mumps can also cause high lipase. How? Pancreatitis. Pancreatitis, pancreatitis is a known complication of mumps. So if mumps causes pancreatitis, then you will get high lipase. With the high amylase. Just a small alert here. Mumps is on the rise, like we have had a, an epidemic of measles recently. Now we are seeing a lot of cases of mumps, and that's been officially reported by the BMC personnel. So, a humble request is if you, anybody of you, sees a case, see a case of mumps, please report or notify. And we will shortly share with you how to report notifiable diseases easily like a simple WhatsApp message to a, some, somebody's uh, a particular number or an email. Yeah. Okay. Amylase is the bingo word. 
last question. And the last question before we uh, take Dr. Mania's lecture. Greet, Sorry. please. Rachita, greet, please. Rachita, the... We are taking a break for Dr. Mania's lecture. Yeah. Hello. Sir? E1. E1. E1, Tamarucha, sir. Name the local agent to treat this condition. Team B. Team B. Um, you can see the lesions around this area. Mupirocin. That's, mupirocin is the correct answer. Which critical complication can occur from infection in this area? Brain sinus. Uh, brain sinus, sinus infection. Cavernous sinus thrombosis or even meningitis. I will give it to them. Wonderful. So full marks to them. Ten marks. Okay, we have the scores, please, before we... Just a quick FAQ on this one. Name a sign common to cavernous sinus Six. thrombosis and Graves' disease. Exophthalmus and restricted eye movements, right? That is an audience question. No, that was in Petigo. What is the word? Mupirocin. Mupirocin. Mupirocin is the bingo word. Sorry. We have the scores? In Petigo and Paradigma, I'm not saying. Different. Team A, 65. Team B, 90. Team B, winners of this first bingo. And prizes, Tushar, uh, to team B. Big round again for all of them. This is not a break. Of course, you can take a bio break, but this is not a break. We are uh, assembling very quickly. And team A, prizes, please. Most welcome, Dr. I have not announced their names. Dr. Ajita, Dr. Devesh, Dr. Vikrant. Dr. Uh, Adwaryu, Pankaj, and Reena. Thank you so much. And keep seated. May I invite a few helpers to shift the tables? Sir, kuch bolu? Bolo na, sir. Matlab main Mike hai, tumhe paas? Sir, sir, ko main banda bolta hoon. Banda is liye ki khuda ka banda nahi. He's the atheist, I think so. But wo ye banda hai, jisko bhagwan yaad karte hain. Hello.
Again, please welcome Dr. Rajesh Munia and Dr. Prasad Shetty. Uh, please come up on stage. Rajesh, you can take that chair so that you'll be facing the camera. Prasad, Dr. Prasad Shetty, please. He's the senior physiotherapist uh, uh, associated with Dr. Rajesh Munia. Uh, so, uh, I'll give you a mic, and uh, you can keep this here when you need it. As I was leaving today, Haan, sir. my daughter asked me, where are you going? And I said, I have an exam to give for one hour. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I have to congratulate you. You became a mama yesterday night. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so Ra Dr. Rajesh Munyar is uh, an orthopedic surgeon, as you know. He specializes in arthroplasty, knee and hip both, and very well known. Uh, two years my senior uh, at Naya Hospital. And uh, a few questions, sir, to you before we go ahead to know you a little better. Uh, as a part of your practice of maybe 35 years? More than that. I started here in India in, 90, in 95. So about 28 years since I started my practice. In India? In India, yes. Correct. So I was in Nair almost for 11 years. Um, and then um, in England for four years and one year in USA. And uh, would you say that right now you are at the peak of your career? Yes. You are. And do you think you can go further ahead from here? Or you are, this I is think the, peak? The, the, the field is really dynamic. And as the technology is improving, the, what we are able to achieve is increasing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we are reached the end of the peak. It is at the peak from where we are, but it's still climbing. Climbing up. And he's, of course, on the cutting edge of technology within the arthroplasty scene. Uh, what are your hobbies other than medicine? So I play golf. Okay. Uh, last 10 years. Uh, and um, the it, orthopedic and golf, two things. Is golf bad for the knee or the spine? Uh, but it is good for life. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think the spine... Um, it is. I think there is a lot of twist that is put to the spine and I actually wear a prophylactic belt when I do that. Wow. And I say that when I play golf, I use the belt so that I can continue to operate. And I put the same when I operate, saying that so that I continue to play golf. <laughs> it is, but you need a lot of spine exercises. He yeah. gets me on the track. and um, uh, But the game of golf, the good thing is that as you age, you can still play it. Yeah. Basically, you can, you're just chasing you a ball by son. walking. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark Twain has said this, that it's a golf. It's a game that spoils your walk. <laughs> because there are breaks in between. Yeah. The, there's a friend who I told, I started this 10 years back. I became a member of the American Knee Society. And that knee, which is a very close-knit group, uh, uh, of arthroplasty surgeons. One day before their annual meeting, they play golf. And oh. I said, I have to now start playing golf. So I took it up 10 years back. 
it is it is an um, it is an amazing game. So I told my friend here, another orthopedic surgeon, let's play golf, and he said, Rajesh, I am still like uh, young. <laughs> yeah, you have to be old to play golf. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it is not true. It is not true. The young boys, the way they play, it's yeah. a fa fabulous game. What's your handicap? My handicap is 23. Okay. This is the first year I've got selected for a, uh, what is called MGL. It is a Mumbai Golf League. It's on the same line as IPL. And, and there are 12 teams, uh, each comprising of 20 people, 2024. 20, so about 250 people play. Seven day tournament, number wow. of eliminations. So I, first year I've got selected to play for that. Wonderful. Great. Uh, with you, we have Dr. Prasad Shetty, another person who I don't know, so I'll ask him questions. <laughs> Prasad, can you take the mic, please? Uh, Prasad, what have you been uh, doing in association with Dr. Maniar? It's been uh, uh, more than, the mic uh, uh, I think it's more than 20 years now I'm with him. Wow. Initially, I worked at Lilavati Hospital, and then I joined him. And I'm very happy that I'm and working with him. you are dedicated to each other. Yes, yes. You yes, don't do yes. anything, no extramarital affairs. Uh, no, no, <laughs> never. never. <laughs> Okay. Only joints. <laughs> Only joints. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So I'll be asking sir some questions related to uh, his area is of course arthroplasty, knee and uh, hip. Uh, we have to focus on the fact that we are addressing family physicians and therefore all our talk you know, uh, will be a little basic talk so that we don't go into major technicalities. At the same time, I would like you to know from him because he's very excited about the knee and the surgery of the knee. And uh, he calls it knee 2023. His talk, any talk that he gives is called knee 2023 because knee 2023 is different from 22 and 21, etc. So uh, we'll ask him questions related to uh, this. So first of all, uh, as I as I learned from him when I met him, is that there are multiple types of knee arthroplasties, total yes. knee replacements. So tell yes. us about those. So you can. Um say that the arthroplasty can be a total knee arthroplasty or a partial knee arthroplasty. And uh, we know that there are three compartments in the knee, medial, lateral, and the patella. We call it as one joint, but we now know that it actually is a three, you know, union of three joints. They all work slightly differently. There are ligaments and things to make them work. The most common part which gets worn out is the medial compartment but the other compartments have some amount of arthritis too. So the commonest surgery that we do, that means 95% or maybe more than that replacement that are happening in the world are total knee replacement where we replace completely. However, with the success of the arthroplasty, people started coming early for the treatment. And if they were beyond the treatment of medical line or of physiotherapy or some of the injections, not as bad to have a total knee, then we sometimes do a partial knee replacement. And this partial knee replacement can happen only on the medial compartment, which is the commonest uh, worn out, or just the lateral compartment, and even patella, just the patella replacement. However, the most successful of all this is the medial compartment partial replacement. I've been doing it from year 2000 in India. And, uh, but, the, but it is a, two things happen with partial replacement. One, one is that selecting the candidate for that is very crucial. If you select someone who has arthritis that is giving pain in from the other compartment and just do partial, that patient is not happy. It's like if you have all the teeth which are gone and you only create a partial denture, it's not going to work. Also, the second is that it is a very technical operation. That Achha. you need to match the new artificial part to the rest of the joint. In a total, you are putting a total one, so in some respects, you are okay. But, so it is a technically demanding operation, and uh, the case selection really needs to be very, very, you need to be astute on that. So hemiarthroplasty usually typically occurs in the younger population than in the older population, as I can understand, is that right? Yes, but there are occasionally older people where we do it, because they are still not so, Bad. you know, their hairs are not completely gray yet. So that is one thing that we should know, that, that this is one area that we can advise. And uh, what imaging will tell the GP that this is only half knee or medial compartment involved? Is an MRI mandatory to now know that this is happening? Yes. So I think the from your standpoint, 
it is the X-ray. Uh, but it's not just the AP X-ray, it's the lateral X-ray and the lateral X-ray taken in standing position with leg fully extended. So it's a little tricky. Um, however, you can go by symptoms. If the patient's symptoms are not for too long, if the patient is still very active, participates in a lot of... Uh, I, I do a lot of partials where people have been playing badminton and tennis and now they come and say that, look, I... Um, uh, I'm, I'm just, I have to take uh, diclofenac before I play and, you know, so early symptoms or very active person, there is a possibility. Now the X-ray evaluation and MRI evaluation, I think it is a little tough and should be left to us. Fair enough. And the first decision I tell people is that do we need intervention? In this patient, are we going to be able to manage with lifestyle modification, painkillers or other things? Or do we need to do something to make this person better? And after having taken that decision, now you decide based on the investigation whether should I do uni or should I do total? Okay. Uh, may I go to uh, Dr. Prasad here for yes. a minute? Dr. Prasad, we, he said that initial involvement may be just of the medial compartment mm -hmm. of the knee. And therefore, if you catch that early, can we reduce the progression from medial to total knee uh, by doing physiotherapy. Can we do that? Yes, sir. Definitely we can do it. But the patient has to cooperate in this part because yeah. mainly the weight reduction. Okay. Nobody is happy to cut yeah. down their intake. So if you cut down the weight, the stress on the joint is less. Okay. So the wear and tear in the other joints will be slower or maybe it will, the surgical intervention will may delay. So as they say, one kg weight loss might reduce the weight across the knee by four, five, four no, kg? Sir, more than that. Sir. More than that. <laughs> yeah. Depending on what activity you're doing. Yeah. The uh, standing in one place for long duration is not good. Okay. Sitting on the floor across legs, that is not good at all. Okay. And going up and down the steps. Uh, as a part of exercise, we don't advise. Uh, we all know that it's good for the heart and the lungs, but definitely not for the joints. Correct. So that has to be avoided as much as possible. And what exercises, if you can demonstrate, we'll be very happy. So what exercise would you advise in patients who have an early knee OA? Yeah. So I'll request every doctor here who has come here, please tell the patient to start with the static quadriceps exercise. Static quadriceps. In, in early arthritis or in the later stage. But this is the one which is a very key in uh, treating the arthritis patient. And this exercise is available on any YouTube and all. Right from the day one, it has to be started and morning and evening at least two times in a day this exercise should be needed at home. Can and you just demonstrate in any simple manner while yes, standing or how the to... Keep the legs straight on okay. the mattress or sitting there. Supine and position. And keep a roll towel of two to three inches of height and keep it under the knee joint, around the popliteal fossa. Then press the knee as much as possible. Hold it for five seconds. Then again relax for five seconds. That is very important, relaxation. Otherwise, muscle will not give contraction. So press for five seconds and hold it for a five second and then relax it. And this do exercise, many repeats. Yeah, at least 25 to 50 in a day, the morning and evening, two times in a day we should do it. So this is good enough for quadriceps? Very good enough, sir. For the quadriceps? Yes. And this? This slows down the wear and tear in the joint also. When the muscles oh. are strong enough, the amount of body which is, um, body weight which is transferred to the joint is less because this muscle will take over that weight. So uh, weight loss? quadriceps strengthening exercises yeah. in which are... And the same yeah. time, I'd be happy if doctors advise them to strengthen one joint proximal and one, point, one joint the distal, that is the hip and the ankle. Because all these, these joints will work together and to put the less pain on the joints. Okay. So these are, of course, as you said, multiple exercise schedules are available on YouTube. And uh, Dr. Shantaram Shetty, our yoga uh, expert, also sh uh, showed us some yogic mudras and exercise asanas. Uh, for this, which we have shared a video with you. Uh, again, coming back to you. I'm so, huh. two more points here. One is, this is a very important point, static quadriceps, because even if you have a surgery in the future, if your quadriceps is good, your recovery is faster. Mm -hmm. Very fast. And the point he made, that it's not just the contraction, it's the relaxation that is as important. When you, after contracting, when you relax the muscles, the blood flows back into the muscles. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing a co contraction continuously, actually the muscle goes into spasm or gets fatigued. You're doing wrong thing. So a lot of the time, he said equal contraction, relaxation. I tell my patients, contract and relax for double the time. And then contract it again. 
And, and I think this is a very good exercise, not only for the people getting knee pain, arthritis, everybody, everybody should do it. A preventive. Yeah. Keeping core stronger, as you said, one joint proximal and distal, very important. And for arthritis, early arthritis, apart from what he said, he did say this also, is to lifestyle modification. Lose weight. Whatever. A lot of patients I get, early knee pain, after they have started Zumba class, aerobic class, or um, uh, yoga in extreme positions, what happens is around about 40, 45, 50, when they are free from the other activity in life, they start, now I want to be fit. And they start with a bang. Uh, you know, Bollywood dancing and this and that, it's fine. 80% of the people will not get anything, continue. Those 20% who get knee pain and start having trouble should immediately think about changing it to something else. There are so many other activities swimming, cycling, which will not yes. put so much pressure on the knee. All off-road off exercises, swimming, cycling. Yeah. So is this aqua aerobics thing it's very good, a very good, good thing? Good, yeah. Even patients, not, they don't know who's, uh, how to swim, but let them go into the pool and they can walk around at least. So Some aqua exercise. aerobics has come up even in the West as a, uh, as a modality for people who can't do many exercises, many sports, and they, they can do exercises within a shallow portion of the swimming pool. Uh, so the aqua aerobics, how, why it works is because in the water your body weight is less. And therefore you're not putting so much load on the joint for doing the same exercise. At the same time, you are putting so much pressure on your muscles to do the work. Mm -hmm. Resistance of the water takes care of you. So aqua aerobics or swimming is very good, except there is one thing which it is not good for. And I want to ask, can I ask one question? Yes, please, please, quiz question for the audience. Exactly. Exactly. So, the someone who has an osteoporosis, I would say, do swim they, because your muscles really, it's something that, but you have to do weight-bearing exercises along with walking or some dumbbells or whatever it is. Just doing swimming every day will actually get you osteoporosis. The people, the, the space, uh, the travelers, when they come back, they've lost 5, 10 kilos of weight. Bone weight. So osteoporosis prevention involves, of course, calcium, vitamin D supplementation, and weight-bearing uh, exercises. OK. Uh, I'll stay with mild osteoarthritis first before we go on to the surgical part. Uh, many people with mild osteoarthritis will be given medical therapy. And uh, we, as physicians, are a little wary of giving NSAIDs again and again and again because of so many things. So uh, first question, is giving topical NSAID a good thing in relieving the pain? Yes, it does work. It does work. Topical and Absolutely. And I think that should be the first uh, uh, line, form of of line of treatment. Immediately after the activity that has caused it, uh, you can combine it with ice pack if it is an acute pain. If it's something chronic, then every morning when they take a bath, they can steam it or put a shower on that. Not doing it too much. These are all symptomatic and temporary relief, but yeah. it works. It works. A step ahead, some people uh, who are wary of surgery, they will probably go in, want to go in for intra-articular injections, either uh, viscous drugs, hyaluronic acid-like, or steroid injection. Your opinion on these? Uh, they work. The steroids work almost 90 to 95 percent of the time. The only time the steroid doesn't work for pain relief I'm talking pain about relief. Mm -hmm. is when um, the it's not just the bone on bone that is causing the pain or inflammation of the synovium that is causing the pain, but it is the overload of the tibial bone underneath. We see that a lot of patients come with severe acute pain. And if you actually do an MRI, you'll see there is an edema on the tibia, on the medial side. In such cases, even giving steroid, they'll say, kuch fayda nahi hua. And, and the So if I get the pathology right, you are saying tibial inflammation occurs because of overload on the tibia. Yeah as the cause of, of peri knee. Acute exacerbation. So there are two reasons why you get ac acute exacerbations in knee, knee OA. One is that the, the debris of the cartilage, et cetera, incites this uh, inflammation in the synovium. And you get a effusion and there is a, uh, you know, completely um, swollen joint. Steroid will work wonders because it's just the inflammation of the synovium which will be brought down. Steroid stays intra-articularly for three to six weeks. Great. If the basic inflammation was strong enough, it'll bounce back. 
However, the second type, where the, the joint doesn't look so inflamed or uh, uh, painful, pain, or swollen, but painful because of the tenderness on the tibia, you can actually see the tenderness not, is not on the joint line, it is a little lower down on the tibia, on the medial aspect. And if you take an MRI, you will see that there is edema of the medial tibial condyle. Effusion is there, but not as, uh, not dramatic. And these patients, even with steroid injections, don't do very well. Because there's no way it is going to relieve that congestion that has occurred in the tibial. The only thing that it will relieve is to go off the load bearing. Lie down or take a knee brace. Even NSAIDs don't work as much as with the inflammation <laughs> in the joint. And so I tell people that when you reach that, we call it secondary changes in my evaluation. There are cysts and a lot of things in the tibia. It's unlikely that you're going to escape surgery. You're mm -hmm. going to ultimately come, come down to that. Uh, steroid injection, I'll stay with that. You said they'll give relief. We are told that they give relief for a few weeks or months. And Depending on at what stage of arthritis you've given it, someone can get a very severe inflammatory reaction very beginning of the steroids. arthritis. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, to the osteoarthritis, oh. when it begins, you get a severe acute inflammation, maybe overexertion. And they may get relief for five years or so. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's just that. So at what stage have you given it? But generally, we reserve it for emergency, someone has severe inflammation, there is marriage in the family, there is a travel, something. But otherwise, we don't recommend steroids more than once or twice at the most. What happens if you give it repeatedly? Um, three months, we can't do a surgery also, sir. Yeah, okay. so if after steroid, we don't do surgery for three months. But apart from that, what happens with, there is a chance of infection with steroid because it brings the uh, local immunity down. And therefore, we do it in the minor operation theater with sterile preparation, never in the clinic. Repeated steroid injection, what it does is that people lose a little bit of pain sensation and they overuse the joint. And that means when the ultimate effect goes, they come back with more damage. And that's what we don't like. So the cartilage gets destroyed more indirectly because yes. of overuse. Yes. So when I give steroid injection, I tell them, look, I've given this to make you pain-free. I've not given this to Treat. overdo. Yeah. What about hyaluronic acid uh, or viscous agents? Right. So now if you look at the peer review literature or recommendations of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, they would not recommend this because it, it is not substantiated by the, by the studies that it consistently improves situation. However, we all use it for la more than 20, 30 years, for two reasons. One, I think it does work in some 30, 40 percent of the patients if given at an appropriate stage, which is early wear and tear, stage one or two, where the cartilage is thinned out, but it is still there. And uh, the, um, if you give it at a stage, which most patient takes it, when I tell them now, you have a surgery, they say, no, no, we'll try with the injection. You know, that's too late a stage where the injection might work. So, and the second reason we give it is that it doesn't harm. Like steroid has some downside. This does not have a downside, except that very rarely you get an allergic reaction. That red and inflamed joint. And I've had one patient where we did this. Therefore, I don't give it to the patient and let them go out of the country in one day or two days. I say, you stay here. If you get an allergic reaction, I may have to put a needle and take out all that gel oh. with the aspiration and give a lavage. So that is very rare, but otherwise there is no downside and a little cost is more than the much more than a steroid injection. So it may work in an early stage and it has no downside. Even in a late say I give it for, for with a chance that it might work a little bit. And second is that the, so that the patient knows that it must, doesn't work. Yeah. You know, the next they stage is come. That, that they are satisfied. Ek yeah. try kar liya. And uh, the third injection that is given is PRP, that is platelet-rich plasma. Yes. I don't use it, so I don't have much experience with that. The reason I don't use is, again, the same. It's a fantastic thing for, a, say, a tendinitis or, a, you know, it has been shown in sports medicine that uh, wherever you have a tendinitis, um, uh, tennis elbow or somewhere else, it, it does work. Okay. Weaker ones. Uh, how, how it can work in a situation of an osteoarthritis where there are no cartilage cells remaining for them to regenerate anything, it doesn't make sense and there are no reports that it will work in the knee, so I don't give it. 
And some people, we think, we think that they are scamsters, but some people also give stem cell therapy. Not in the knee. It's a hopeful, uh, the, see, I explained this, that you need some cartilage cells there. When there is bone on bone, there are no cartilage cells there for you to utilize anything or to heal. And no, I don't think so stem similarly, cells work. Glucosamine and chondroitin, they can't be given if the cartilage is completely worn. But do you give them in early stage? I give it. I give it to all the patients. As I again say it, that generally there is no downside to it. The, uh, and in an early stage, it does work. Glucosamine. Glucosamine. Like many of my, my friends, they run marathon, etc. And while they are doing this, they start getting the symptoms. So I say, look, take vitamin D. Make sure your vitamin D is not 30. 30 we consider normal. But for us, we con I consider it 60, 70 at least or up. I want rapid healing there. And glucosamine is synthesized by those chondrocytes, which are still there when the cartilage is thinned out, but it is there. Also, when there is bone on bone, I give it because there is surrounding cartilage which is taking load. See, all of us have seen that when you have painful knee, you start walking slightly differently. A lot of these people start going down the steps sideways so that there is other cartilage which you are utilizing. And if you can make it stronger by giving glucosamine, chondroitin, there is no harm. So I, I do give it. People have to take it regularly for it to be effective. And uh, it can be given longer time, one, one and a half, two years. But generally, then it loses. You can give a break and then give it again. Okay. Somehow, there, it also has, it is, although it is not, it also has analgesic effect. When your early patients come and you give them, they say, we've not given anything else, just the supplements and they say, my pain is gone. That quickly it will go, there may be some analgesic effect to it. Okay. So as a family physician, the most common question that the audience or the, the a patient will be asking them is, Gutne mein dard hai, operation karao ki ruk jao. That is the most common question that, uh, to, ah, sorry. No, fantastic question. That's, Good that's question. the key. For us also, when the patient walks in, this is the key. Is this patient going to be treated conservatively or surgically? The three things. You must decide on three things. One is pain. Second is the activity of daily living and how much uh, affection in the air. And the third is the instability. And I'll give you guidelines on all the three of them. The pain, are they taking painkillers? Paracetamol, doesn't matter. Ultraset also, probably not. But if they're taking NSAID, and once in a while, once in 10, 15, 20 days, it probably still is okay. He may not say yes, but I would not consider. If he, they're taking once a week or twice a week, then that, that's something we don't want long term. Also, you can, another thing that is very effective is to ask them that what is your pain visual analog score? Ask them what is your highest pain that you get in this knee and the minimum pain that you get. Uh, zero, all of us know that. We have, we have sent a chart to them. Okay, so zero score. is no pain, 10 is the pain where there cannot be any more pain. You put your hand in the fire and the sort of pain that you would get. So if they, if they give their number five or above, then they are likely to be a candidate for their highest pain. Generally, it is eight, nine, 10. You don't even need to convince them. You know, it's the five, six, seven. So above five, more likely to need surgery if their highest pain. And below that, if it is one or two, it is mild. I would just say no medication except for glucosamine and vitamin D. Three, four, five, at least some NSAID or something will be required. So the pain, most important. The second is that activities of daily living. Are you able to do? There are two types, I, I tell them. One is well, everyday life, you know, going to the bathroom, doing things, going to market and getting things. Before that, are you doing your leisure activities that you want to do? You know, you want to at least walk a kilometer or two in a garden or somewhere or do some other things for your enjoyment. And if you're not, if there is too much curtailment to that, most of the ladies, they come and tell me, doctor, now do it because everybody goes for vacation, I don't. You know, she's able to do everything else otherwise for activity of daily living. That's for the elderly people. So this activity of daily living and if someone, elderly patients particularly, if they find it difficult to get up and go to the bathroom or they decide that tomorrow when I go out, I'll finish these three works. Once in a week, I'll go out and finish this work. That means there is an affection to activity of daily living, which can easily be treated and made better, and made better permanently. 
with the techniques and technologies we have. So activity of daily living. And the third is the instability because the arthritis comes with deformity, varus, valgus, flexion deformity, sometimes hyperextension deformity. And all of this is going to lead to instability because these are pillars on which we are standing, two pillars. And if the pillars are not straight, slightly bent, they're not going to transmit the load correctly. In addition, when you walk on an uneven surface, you might tumble. And therefore, instability is the third part, three things. Generally, instability is something that when I see them walking, I would know. But first two parts, you can go into detail. So pain, activities of daily living, and instability. And uh, therefore, the patient helps you decide whether surgery is indicated or not. Uh, here, uh, anybody knows this Mukesh song which was sung in the style of K.L. Seigel? Dil jalta hai to jalne de, aansu na bha, priyad na kar. Now we, I'll take your permission to play our Dr. Subodh Natkarni, who's a good singer, absent today. He has recorded that when you have to operate, he said that if you have to go, you have to go, aansu na bha, priyad na kar. So there's two lines here. It's a summary of sending the patient to the doctor. It's a summary of sending the patient to the doctor. घुटना चलता है तो चलने दे आंसू जो बहे फरियाद तू कर घुटना चलता है तो चलने दे जब हद से दर्द तेरा बढ़ जाए तू मणि यार सर को याद तो कर घुटना चलता है तो चलने दे या सो सो दिस दिस एस लॉन्ग मिंग ऑफ़ कोर्स द पेशेंट डिसाइड्स समटाइम्स वेदर दे कैन टॉलरेट एंड डू देर एक्टिविटीज there is one more point I wanted to make, and mm. it is, you know, because this is a surgery to improve quality of life, there is a vast difference. You know, we have people who come in and say that, I used to walk five kilometers every day, and I can't walk more than two now, please do something for me. Or I used to play tennis, badminton, and do something for me now. And there are many housewives, they say that I don't go out, but I don't need to go out. I'm at home all the time and I, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm at home, it doesn't hurt me. So, you know, and I don't want surgery. So there is a difference. And the, uh, I, let me just give you this example. Yeah, Our yeah. Dr. O.P. Kapoor, uh -huh. I did his knee replacement when he was 91 year old. So he used to come and see me and suddenly that one day he came and said that uh, for me, I need to go to the tennis court every day and hit some balls. He was a tennis player and a very, very, uh, keen player. At that age, he was only hitting the balls at the at the uh, at Billingdon at the you know at the service line, and not his coach would return it. He would not run around, but he was not able to do that. And he said, "I want to do it." So at 91, I did his knee replacement, and in in three months, he was back doing the. <laughs> um, and he did that for a year, year and a half before he had that cardiac surgery and the. So, so. That is it. That was his driving force, which somebody would think at 91, you know. So since you are at this age factor, there's no maximum age? There's no maximum age. Uh, above 90, I don't, I'm really wary. Um, there's one patient who I actually operated at 87, and I told him have the other one, he just didn't, and then he finally came to have it done at 101. Ooh. <laughs> And he said, uh, I've interviewed him, I've taken his, he said, doctor, all risk is mine. Yeah. Please do it. But mm -hmm. I didn't do it. And one was a bit too much for me to do. Uh, so, th yes, there is no age uh, restriction as long as patient wants it fit enough medically. You know, the risk that we take, anesthesia and other thing is reasonable to take. We can go ahead and do it. You did say that the x-ray and the MRI probably need to be interpreted better by the orthopedic surgeon. And therefore, when we have a patient of knee, knee pain, uh, we may not ask for the x-ray and MRI and let the orthopedic surgeon ask for it. 
Also, I am a little disturbed by the fact that many hospital complete health checkup schemes have knee x-ray as a part of their scheme. And I think we should ignore the knee x-ray, even if the right early osteoarthritis is seen. Because if the patient does not have pain, this was taken incidentally, we can probably forget. Yeah, I, I think if the patient does not have pain, don't do the x-ray. Because if you look for, everybody will have some gray hair, right? Absolutely. And it is unnecessary. It, it is nature that with age, joint is going to have some degeneration. Right? Don't start getting worried about it. And, um, but at least, you know, I think they could ask for the x-rays. They could ask for the They could. You should ask for an appropriate x-ray. You should ask for a standing x-ray. And never of one leg, both knees. So you can judge where the, uh, uh, the progress of the arthritis is. Also, when you take both x-rays, patient stands on both legs, equal whatever weight they are uh, putting on the legs, and then takes the x-ray. If you take a one-leg x-ray, they might put extra weight on the leg which is being done, and you get a uh, false, space. false more arthritis on that. So AP x-ray, standing x-ray, ideally on a long film, so you can see the bone above and below, not a tiny film. Because alignment is only judged on that. In fact, you need for alignment a long leg x-ray, which we take from hip to the ankle. But at least a longer x-ray here. And a lateral x-ray, ideally also in a standing position. That is what two x-rays you should do. Uh, may I go to Prasad? Prasad, uh, what are the commonest questions asked to you by osteoarthritis patients? Just FAQ kind of thing. What Sir, is your... There is a phobia in patient that they all think that post-operatively, the physiotherapy is very painful. Okay. So most of the patients, they say no for surgery is only for that reason. Believe me, sir, there is no pain at all. I have seen one or two patients here who have yeah, operated in this ground. <laughs> Maybe. You can ask them, sir. There is no pain at all. It's all threshold, depends on person to person. Mm -hmm. And sir, does it in a, such a way that there is no muscles are cut nowadays. Okay. Patients who have been operated in the morning, they are made to stand on the same day itself. In the evening, they are made to walk on the same day. The second day is the commode training. The third day, they can walk around in the room. They can go to the washroom and come back. So most of the rehab done in the hospital. The patient don't have to depend on anybody else. They can go their own and come back to the washrooms. And once they're back home, they're independent. And exercises are very simple, sir, nowadays. Okay. We get 90 degrees of flexion on, on 14th day itself. You get 90 board. degrees of flexion? Yes, more than that sometimes. But sometimes I stop it because I don't want any thread to be pulled, which are the deep sutures inside. And for that reason only, I stop it in 90 degrees. Once the staples are out, we increase it. And when they come for the six weeks follow-up, they're 130, 140. So 120 degrees is more than enough to sit cross-legs on the floor. That is what the people ask for it because they want to sit on the floor. Six is, but normally, sir, does, doesn't allow them to sit three, uh, for three months because we don't want that ligaments to be overstretched. The recovery is fantastic after that. So I don't think there should be right. no reason for delaying the surgery or avoiding it when we have a fantastic results. Now, before we go to the actual surgery, uh, we just were reading literature about preventing staphylococcal infection by giving mupirocin nasal swabs or chlorhexidine baths. Does that, is that followed in Leelawati or her uh, reliance by your... Yeah, so I think the key thing in total knee is to prevent infection because you're putting so much of foreign body inside. And there are a lot of things that you need to do. What we need to understand is that the source of infections can be two. One is from external and the second is the body itself. Now, there are the commonest infection after any surgery, particularly implant, is the staphylococcus, which can be, you know, a, a, a commensal or whatever in the patient herself, either in the nose, axilla, or the hand, most common reason, or in the surgeon's uh, body. And therefore, the protocol is that you should treat these areas using mupirocin, local mupirocin, so that you can take care of that. So all our patients on admission get uh, a previous night, they get a chlorhexidine bath. They take a chlorhexidine bath, they get these applications, and next day they again have a chlorhexidine bath. For years, that means when I started in 95, uh, Dr. Ajita Desai was at Hinduja, and she was one of the best microbiologists, so I used to go and speak to her, and I used to, all the doctors, surgeons who 
would join me as a fellow and I myself would go and get my swabs tested. And that time the protocol was that if you are, a, you are harboring positive this, then you get treated. Uh, over the years, then the protocol is that you don't need to test it, just apply it because there is no downside to the... So that's what we do. You, you apply mupirucin on yourself? Correct. But I'm not a, uh, this thing because I have tested, so I don't know. Okay. Correct. And uh, ideally, you need to do the test, and if you are positive, you should do it. Correct. So you need to do so your... It is, it is... However, today, I don't think it is the surgeon that is passing on the infection, because we wear a spacesuit, we have a laminar airflow. All of us are in spacesuit. Not only me, my assistants, the whole team, sister and everyone. And there is a laminar airflow from the up so that any air that is traveling down, any, any my breath or anything coming out of the, this thing is taken Washed out, out. Mm. doesn't come back to the patient's operation, uh, this thing. Uh, but patient's own skin, and that also is mainly the skin around there. So we use iobarn to stick. So there are a lot of uh, precautions that, that you take. So infection really doesn't worry us now because of so much that is available to prevent it. And, and the patient's own body, of course, we investigate the one which worries us most is the urine infection. And elderly patients, elderly ladies have a chronic urine infection history. Then I think we need to treat all of those before we do the surgery, dental infection. Okay, uh, now we spoke at the very beginning of three types of surgeries that you do. I was actually referring to three types of total arthroplasties. You told me once that you had the conventional which you have given up then now you have uh, something that is associated with computer uh, related, uh, what do you call it? Navigation. navigation. And now there is a robotic uh, involved yes. with the navigation. Okay. So uh, I just want us to know a little bit about each so that you know we, we know what to recommend or what is preferable for us also or our patients also. So the, the total knee replacement, when you're replacing the joint, Remember, we are doing two things. We are, we are replacing the cartilage, right? But we are also aligning the joint. And the aim is to align the hip, knee, and ankle in straight line. That's, that's the pillar. And when we do a conventional technique with just the instruments, open up the joint and put a rod inside the femoral medullary canal and judge that the, he uh, the head is about five degrees from the medullary canal and make a cut accordingly and do, you are doing a guesswork and you are, we realize that we are accurate 60, 70, 80% of the time. A lot of experienced uh, surgeons also will be 20% time off. And so the new technique came up and that is the computer navigation, which is same as the GPS that we use for our cars. There are two satellites which are tracking your position and like eyes seeing them, you can get a depth. So you're able to exactly pinpoint where that car is there on the road or in the, in the geographically located. The same thing, in the operation theater, we have two cameras which throw infrared light onto uh, some of the markers that we put on the bone. The reflected light is picked up by the camera and computer makes the calculation. We do all the movement of the leg and based on that, when I do a circular movement, the circles that are created actually are having a conical movement and that the center of the femoral head is the tip of the cone. That's how it identifies where the center of the hip is. Center of the knee, we have opened the joint, we can actually mark out so the computer knows. And the ankle again, it has a very constant anatomical calculations from medial and lateral malleolus. 56% from one side, 44 from the other, at an angle which is so these are the things which you can easily mark, these two points. And so computer now knows where the center of the hip is, center of the knees, and center of the ankle is, how much degree of deformity you have, and you want to achieve zero degree or one degree. Today in the world we are debating whether we should go zero, one, or two, or three. But whatever you know you want to achieve for individual patient, the computer will allow you to achieve it very accurately. So that the moment I started using this computer navigation in 2004, the, my results, we published in an American journal, Journal of Arthroplasty, jumped from 80% accuracy to 94% accuracy in first 100 patients. Accuracy and of alignment, alignment of the joint. Of the, this getting this hip, knee, and ankle in one line. 
And the moment we had finished 500 cases, we looked at another 100 cases and we were 100% of the time accurate. So this one thing is completely removed from your uh, the, uh, uh, mistake department. Mistake, that you now have a correctly aligned joint every time. So from 2004, I started in July. In just one month, I stopped doing conventional technique, realizing that this is good. So, Before I'll we go further, is conventional technique still done in Mumbai? Yes, conventional technique, see, uh, yes, it is done. In fact, 90, 95% of the joint replacements done are conventional technique. So I don't think we should disregard them completely. But if something better is available, uh, why not? And, and so I think the thing is that the conventional technique will make you better 70, 80% of the time in alignment and few other things. So knee replacement is not just alignment. There is balancing of the joint. You need to... If I can explain you like this, that if you have a horse, riding a horse, and the check rein is tight on one side, the horse is constantly tight. It's not going to run faster, there's pain. Same thing for the knee. If you have one ligament tighter than the other, it'll bend and extend, but it'll not be very happy. And, and the knee has not just medial and lateral, there is a front and back ligament, there are ligaments inside, so there's a lot of balancing that is required. It's not just the... Uh, but alignment is one very important part. Once you get the alignment right, the balancing that is required is minimum and easy to do. So computer navigation is not there in 80% of the places in Mumbai because of cost? Because of the cost and the time it takes to master Learning it. Learning curve. And the time it takes to uh, mm, do it. It does involve, I need more people in the theater. I need uh, more time, okay. uh, but eventually it pays off. Hmm. So computer navigation is very important. I would not operate anyone without, uh, unless you know, there's just, uh, once I was in China doing a live surgery at a conference, they had invited me and I reached there and realized that there's no computer navigation. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I did a conventional technique, but I'm just saying that generally I would not uh, uh, do operation without a computer. So the third advancement that has occurred in your place is? Is the robotic surgery. And that is the most recent one. Last two years I've been using it. Now you must remember that the robotic surgery is still, is two parts. Robo machine has two parts. One part is computer navigation. So we can't do away with that. And, and the second part is, second machine is the robotic hand. Now those robotic hands are of two types. There is an active robo and there is a passive robo. Now the active robo it, it works like this, that you have somewhere you fix the pins and give it to the robo and robo will come around. You just put the numbers that you want will come and make the cuts and go away. And, and I don't use that and most of the orthopedic surgeon would not like to use that because something wrong can happen. It's not a simple two bones or a piece of wood that is being cut. There, there are ligaments, there is arteries, there are a lot of other things, muscles and tendons. So we use passive robo, and passive robo is where the robotic hand is guided by the computer navigation at an angle, and from there it'll cut the bone only in one angle, and it'll cut precisely that bone there. It is still operated by the surgeon. How much force to give, how much easy to cut, because our bones vary. Somebody's bone is porotic, someone is very strong. Also, each bone, you know, when I cut tibia, anteriorly it is very hard. The moment I reach middle, it is very soft. So there are, there are things that surgeon still has to do. And therefore, most of the autopilots when they fly, they fly, taking off and landing, they will still take it in their hand. So I think there are more uh, things that are required at some point of time. So it's the passive robo which has become very popular. And, and that is what I use. What, what, why do you like the robo? So the, the because the bone that I prepare is very, very uniformly prepared. It is, it is, um, in the first go, I can prepare the bone correctly because the robo will not move here and there. Whereas with the conventional saw, which I used with the computer navigation, I can go wrong. I have to then check. If I have gone wrong, I have to refine it. And I can do it two, three, four time comes and achieve the, but this will go faster and in the first go. So much that a lot of the times I have stopped checking. Mm -hmm. and, and so it saves time and also every time you cut the bone, you're causing friction and burn, right? Mm -hmm. So you reduce that now. In the first go, you're cutting it right. Also, the, our thinking has started changing. 
Um, the way we've designed the joints currently was based on the ability of us doing the joint, say 50 years back. How we could put it in, that's how that joint was designed. Now I think in the next 10 years, we are going to completely think differently and make a joint look differently. Thank and you. maybe thinner metal, maybe different metal. Maybe we will start saving both the cruciate ligaments, which at the moment we don't. So I think we are going to evolve. For example, when the cars were designed 100 years back, they were tall cars, big cars. Slowly we realized that it can go faster. We have better tires. We have better engines. We started making them aerodynamic. And our formula cars are completely different because the way we are able to use them now. So same thing will happen with uh, robotic surgery. And so I have no doubt that the robotic surgery is a further step forward. Navigation, I think, was four or five steps forward compared to conventional. Now we're taking one or two steps forward, Small but step. it is still a step forward. Well, uh, so as we just realized, there are three types of total knee replacements, conventional, uh, helped by uh, robots, uh, the computer navigation, and the robotic surgery with computer navigation, uh, three types. Uh, I'm now, do you have a video to show? May I request you? Yeah, I just, it's... Uh, two, three, four minutes, and yeah. that will give them and an idea where we've reached. After which, I would like the audience to ask you questions. Sure. Is it okay? Because you you called this uh, SOS 2023, I've called it TKA 2023, where we've reached. <laughs> so my journey with Total Knee, it started when I was in Nair Hospital. I was doing a lot of HTOs. Will we dim the lights on the stage, please? Thoda dim the stage. So here is a patient. Uh, we we'll wait, we'll wait for the lights to get dimmed a bit. Koi hai udar? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so yes, sir, you can go ahead. So this is a patient three months after total knee arthroplasty. He's 73 year old, and you can see he's back to his laser activity in the gym and swimming as well. Here are patients one year after bilateral total knee arthroplasty. Both of them within their first year after the total knee arthroplasty are back doing things that they want to do. Here are two patients. One is 10 year after both knee replacement. Other one is 14 year after both knee replacements, a doctor's wife. On your left is, uh, she's a teacher, Bharat Natyam, the other lady, actually took up Kathak after doing total knee replacements, six years of course, and now she gives uh, stage performances. It is stuck. Maybe I'm pressing the wrong thing. Directing the... You can, you can, you can do it for me. While they are uh, doing, you said bilateral. So when would you do bilateral together? Okay, so um, very good question because both knee means two major operations. You need to check cardiopulmonary status. If a patient is below 75, has a good cardiopulmonary status, then only we would do both together. And of course, both knees should be painful. As I said, VAS score above five is very important. A lot of patients come to us with seven vas on one side and three on the other side, but they say, no, no, do both for me. I generally don't. Because the problem with the knee replacement is that it is still an artificial part that you're putting in the knee. And, and you're not going to like it. You can't remove a good tooth and put a denture and they like it. No, that will not happen. So let that vas become five and above. And so both knees needing surgery and fit patient, we would do. And that also I have started doing both together only after st I started using computer navigation. Because not conventional. Not conventional because I, you need to put a femoral road inside the medullary canal, which is the source of bleeding and a source of fat embolus during the surgery. Both are very bad for the general health if you do it on both sides. So rod is put through the femoral canal only in conventional? Only in conventional not because in you need to take guided. at least some cue on the alignment. Mm -hmm. Not very accurate, but some cue. So here is this lady, I operated her in 98 or so, both knees, she was 135 kilos, 
And here on your right, you can see her 20 years later, the x-rays are looking pristine. She is still walking around doing everything, 80 plus. Now she's completed 25 years. Can you go next? Yeah, here is another patient, rheumatoid arthritis. I operated in her in 96 to 97, three joints I replaced. Both knees, one hip. And here you can see her 20 years, she's walking. She has now completed 27 years. All the three joints are still functioning. Can you go further, please? Yeah, these are again 20 year, because we are currently reporting in American Journal 20 year results of this particular joint. This is a mobile bearing joint, which I like because it has the least wear and tear and also allows the knee movement, not only the flexion and extension, it does have a rotation movement, which our meniscus allow. So you call it, what joint did you call it's it? A, it's called mobile bearing knee. The other is mobile a fixed bearing. Bearing, bearing, bearing is mobile. Okay. Yeah. And these are two patients, 20 years from surgery. X-ray is looking pristine and they are doing good functional activity. So this is what computer navigation gave us this, that we could now align hip, knee and ankle in one line in every case. Even in very severe knee, you can see here that completely destroyed joint. These, on that X-ray on the left, if you see and see her clinical picture, you, the, the, the knee is completely out of alignment. And after the two surgeries using navigation, both legs are straight, good function. She is at 10, 16 years doing well. So my experience with TKA in India, 7,000 plus knees. Navigation, more than 5,000 knees. And now for last two years, almost 300 robotic knees. So this is what robot does. Whichever angle I need to cup the bone, the computer will align it. And all I have to do is pick up the saw and cut it without, without worrying that I'm, I'm going to be even a micromillimeter wrong. So the current aim of the doing this surgery is to make the patient pain-free as early as possible. That's what the most, most research has gone into in last five years. Rapid recovery and to allow them laser activity. <laughs> this is a patient operated. Today is the Please second speak. day after my surgery. Uh, I'm at Beach Candy Hospital and I was amazed that when I got out of the surgery in the same day in the evening, I was able to get off by the side of my bed and stand with the help of the walker, of course, but I was able to stand. The next day, I was able to walk right to my bedroom door and even a little beyond that, I'm using the commode and I'm completely comfortable. There's no pain and I've been able to do all my exercises. I've, I can take my leg up and down, move it side to side and everything. And the best part is that I'm completely pain free. And I was avoiding this surgery since last one, one and a half years because everybody was scaring me that you'll get a lot of pain and for two months you won't be able to do anything. You'll be like this, you'll be so dependent, but it's nothing of the sort. And I'm absolutely delighted. Hello. This is 14 days stitch removal patient walking elderly without a stick. I think I need to go fast. Let me just finish quickly. These are the activities that they can do. This is Surya Namaskar, bilateral total knee replacement done. Patient able to... So each one is different. And it's not completely zero pain as she was saying, but it is so much better managed now that patients are not really bothered with it. These are patients playing golf and this patient on the right is the unicompartmental uni knee replacement. Tracking, cycling and in fact this gentleman in just three months had a total journey of 372 kilometers in Italy on cycle. So it is possible to achieve a very good function but it is a very technical job and there are instrument now available to achieve that. Wow. There are many questions that I might not have asked and therefore uh, we'll give the mics to the audience. Can we, can we give uh, one mic? Uh, Moina, yeah, please sit and raise your hand. I'll just take them one by one. Go by behind to Dr. Uh, Saula. And Dr. Saula, then you pass it to Dr. Uh, Bhar, uh, Gajreya. And Gajreya, uh, you will forward it to Dr. Devish. 
we'll, we will try to take as many as we can. So what are the reasons of pain post-operative? Many, many doctors say that the repair work or the recovery will take four, three to four months. Second question. Then third, there are some patients who limp after the surgery also. So that is right. Uh, it should not be there. Yes. So these are the common questions from the patient as well. The, the pain is because of the surgical insult itself. If you have a cut somewhere, it's going to hurt. So similarly, the cut is going to hurt you. There is so much manipulation of the tissues that has happened. The leg which was in a bad alignment, the ligaments which got fibrotic in that position are suddenly stretched. So those are a lot of reasons why the pain would occur. It is much more in a knee because immediately you want to start moving it and bearing the weight, etc. If you have an area on the abdomen where operation is done, you are not actually immediately using it. So I think those are the reasons, the cut itself. And um, but what, is, what we've learned is where does the nerves lie, where are your incision to be taken, which ligaments, how to handle them. And this uh, management of the pain by giving periarticular injections, we give an injections inside the knee, key areas where the pain starts, where the pain triggers off. We've, we've realized this, that if you let the patient be in pain for first one or two days, then it's very difficult to get their pain down afterwards. If that first 24, 48 hours are, is managed well, then they will be better off. Having said that, we realized when we used epidural and we took their pain completely off, and when they actually felt pain after 48 hours, it was very bad because initially they would expect some pain. If there is no pain and suddenly they get a pain, they get worried. So we've gone out of the epidural for two reasons. One is that we don't like this complete pain relief and then rebound pain. Second is while the pain relief occurs with uh, epidural, there is also muscle activity which is, uh, which is hampered and therefore there is a chance of fall and fracture. So nowadays we, and the surgery has become quicker, so nowadays no epidural, unless it is a bilateral knee, then we need a longer duration. It is spinal anesthesia, patient gets up in the evening and the pain relief in that initial 24 hours is because of the injections we give around the knee and I've just presented a adductor block which a surgeon can give at one of the American meeting. That really relieves the pain. Dr. Ajire, sir. And the, there were many questions, three, four months. I think the overall recovery takes almost a year. We know that you have a fracture, almost a year you've got to exercise things. The muscles have to realign, deformity, ligaments have to restretch. It's a slow process. The bone remodeling has to happen. So we'll keep the questions one by one, keep them short also. Sir, one uh, indication for an X ray scanogram. So after we do a routine X ray where we come to know that the patient has got osteoarthritis, is it the right indication to ask for an X ray scanogram and then refer it to the right orthopedic surgeon? No, there is no need to do scanogram at your level. If a surgeon is doing a surgery with a conventional technique, it is better to do a scanogram that at least you have an idea that what is the angle between the femur and the head of the femur and what angle to cut. But for diagnosis purpose and for decision purpose that whether to do the surgery, you don't need a scanogram. Dr. So Gajdeya. Sir, the next question, sir. In patients with diabetes with HbA1c's of more than need, do you promote uh, the surgeries? Uh, generally not. The initial guideline was that it should be below 7 uh, or at least 8 in a patient where it is very difficult to bring it down further than that. Today, actually, the guideline from Mayo Clinic in USA is that you don't need to look at HbA1c you actually want your fasting and PP to be within a correct level. And you should not achieve that by giving high doses of insulin in the next one or two days. It should be something which is managed over a period of time and that's where it is remaining. But we do look at HbA1c. If someone comes with 10 and 11, and mind you, a lot of people come with that sort of Hb, we don't operate. We at least want to see it below eight or at least see it falling. Oh. No, so, uh, so uh, when the person is getting pain, while climbing down the staircase or climbing up the staircase. Is there any differential in that? Yes, so I'll tell him also to uh, uh, talk on that. But yes, when you're going up and down the steps, you're putting three times your body weight, sometimes four times. So that means you're really loading the joint heavily and therefore it hurts compared to walking heavily. Now when you're going up, you are just lifting yourself against the gravity, your muscle has to do the work. But when you're coming down, you are actually breaking your fall. If you think of it, you're going, and if you, if you don't have enough balance, you're going to fall. 
and you're going to hurt yourself. And that's why going down is one of the most worrisome activity when you have an arthritis in the knee. And it does hurt more when you're going down. So you have anything to add about uh, up and down? That's the reason I have told that to start the uh, static cordyceps exercise because if the knee is in a flexion deformity, definitely the patient will buckle and they may fall. Oh, uh, what are your standard exercises that you give? Maybe post-op? Post-op is only the strengthening exercise and then uh, the best thing is to achieve the extension as much as early as possible than the flexion because everybody is concentrating on flexion knee joint, the kitna band, how can we sit down on the floor? That is not very important. The knee extension is very important. If there is a two degrees or three, even three degrees of flexion deformity, will change the gait of the patient and there will be difference in the length of the leg also. When you say it has to be complete yes, 180? complete extension slight, is very important. Slight flexion also is not good. Yes, so extreme bending, like stretching, you know, it's not good because again you are forcing the ligaments to stretch, which is not good at all. Maybe after a year or two years when we can, the patient come back to us to, for examination, we might, we might have seen many patients with hyperextension. Yes. So not to force the knee for any flexion or extreme extension. And Second uh, question, I know it's a little bit uh, difficult. Can we give oral steroids to reduce the pain? For pain. And for the pain, and then so how long can we give that? So in terms of oral steroid working, yes, it'll work because it is a strong anti-inflammatory, but I don't recommend that. I don't know, Tushar, you can tell more. Up. If, if a steroid is required, maybe a local steroid and one shot, that is what I would recommend. I never prescribe oral steroids for either a pre-op patient or post-op patient. I have never done that. Okay, they wish. Is it, is it harmful for you? Will it be difficult for you when you do a CTR? Yes, I've had a lot of patients. We do their ACTH and other levels, and then we can't operate them for a few months till everything becomes normal. So pre-op steroids also will contraindicate the uh, Yes, and surgery. then their pain management after the operation becomes even more difficult. Sir, prophylactically, so many recommend that you start taking chondroitin and glucosamine uh, every three months in a year. I mean, if you are in the sports and all. So is it after 40 or 45, do we recommend So, that? prophylactically, even if you have no symptoms, no. I don't give it. No need? No. If you, if you have whatever activity you are doing it, and if your knees are not hurting it, no. Okay. But I do recommend that your vitamin D level should be very good. Calcium should be taken. Vitamin B12 also should be good because ultimately your healing capacity or this, uh, you know, tissues is better if you have good vitamin B12. So that I would recommend, but I never recommend glucosamine. I only recommend it once there are symptoms. And uh, yeah. uh, one question to we Dr. Shetty. We will uh, keep questions to one each yeah. from now onwards. Devesh, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, in the gymming, when we do the extensions, you, you mean there also we should do the relaxation part for five seconds yes. and then? Because we are regular gymers. So yeah. The best thing is the cordyceps is the offload, like I said, no? sitting on the uh, bench or where you can do the exercises, where the body weight is not coming on the joints. Okay. Standing, lunges, squatting is really bad for the knees. And uh, extension? Yeah. Don't extension? Do that. Uh, we can do it in a different way. No? Extension can be done in that, in sitting. Okay. Sitting is better. Sitting is better. Yeah, yeah. With less weight and more repetitions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sir, especially in elderly people, and uh, some, more, some of them are refusing for the operation. What are the roles of various stripes and cans, various types available? Are they really useful? Uh, various the stripes that uh, elastic the support or uh, various They are all useful. So one of the things that I told you is the instability. And the moment you have instability, it is better to have an extra support. Either to the knee, in terms of kneecap, with the hinges on the side, and there are different types, how much uh, support you need. The problem is that they, at some point of time, they become cumbersome to use, but it does work. And so you limit the use only while walking, then they'll continue to use it for a long time. That is one. The second is the cane, it definitely will work. I tell a lot of patients, you know, you started loading the other one, now you don't have a third one, but if you have a stick, you load that, the trouble with using the stick or the walker is that you start transferring the load to the shoulders. And these are elderly patients, they'll come up with the shoulder issues. And I, I will give it to him for a minute because this is very important. 
they that you use walker and a stick correctly and uh, some guidelines if you can give them yeah the walker you should shoot the frame the upper part of the frame should be exactly on the trochanteric level not less than that the moment you put it less then they start so leaning on this that. yes yeah here. hip joint we so start le right. leaning on that and they start getting the rotatory cuff pain and we have seen many patient with the rotatory cuff muscle injuries also because they use it for long and long duration so out of various type of sticks huh. e elbows elbows stiff that means elbow should be semi flex sir yeah, semi flex yeah. no yes the full extension yeah. of the upper arm yes yes that is better semi semi flex okay semi flex yeah, and the height of the stick you said is same level sir the trochanteric, trochanteric yeah, stick yeah, uh, level yeah. so that means your elbow will be flexed yeah and you can adjust it and after some times when the pain is better or the medication is working very well at that you can reduce it also so this is this is the key thing what he is saying now is to if someone is using it for say in 15 20 days you change the height slightly differently now you're loading a different part of your muscle or using different so keep changing it even for people with back this thing i tell that in the in the clinic you are using computer at one level you change your height of the seat or the desk every now and then so that if you are watching tv or every day this side sometimes look at this side yes sir yeah so uh, post operative as we have seen the life of the patient is for multiple years now and uh, what are the things which patients post operatively should not do because they have to live for the next 25 years what should they not do so i think generally i don't restrict them in on one side we want to give them all the activity that they can do and then say that don't use it but there are two or three activities which are bad for artificial implant one is jumping and jogging high impact activity if you repeatedly do that remember ultimately you fix this into the bone with a cement or whatever it can lose an out so so high impact activity and most of this patient won't be able to do high impact activity so that jumping jogging aerobics and things like that the uh, second thing is what he pointed out earlier he pointed out earlier that the weight of course if they put on weight lot of people after the operation they come back and they put on weight which is not really good because you are going to load your joint that also uh, more or less with the better material and the alignment we are not worried but they should not overstretch the joint and make it loose we are completely um, uh, in india we think about getting my knee to bend all the way down and sit on the floor the better function of the knee is that it keeps you standing and you are able to walk for life and do your activities in order to try and get the flexion if you stretch your ligaments so much that your stability when you are walking is jeopardized then that's not right everyone has a limit you know if he can run 10 uh, 100 meters in 10 seconds i may not be able to do that we have to know that after knee replacement i am still me i am not made tushar right so everybody has a limit we'll take one last question from the lady here Sir, who wanted uh, to ask <laughs> yes ma'am i'll repeat the question use of knee bracelet braces are they harmful for the muscles so just give the stability to the joint but these knee uh, braces or the knee caps to be used only when walking not otherwise okay the simple knee caps you can give any patients but patients with the deformities like they have a lateral thrust where the joint on weight bearing going sideways better to give them a hinged knee caps hinged knee cap and what is important is that while they use this only for 2 hours the other hours they must exercise their quadriceps hamstring i am also prophylactically using a belt to play my game but i make sure that i exercise my core my spinal muscles because I, if you use something for long your muscles become lazy you know and you don't want that to happen sir one one last uh, sir we'll take the last question there thank you so yes. regarding the different joint materials and the, the material allergy do you do any allergy test before implanting the material also the, there are a patient coming in asking zirconium gold so your uh, take on different materials for the joint replacement okay so yeah a good question the the metal allergy or any material allergy it does exist it is very rare uh, the allergy that you get on the skin is different the allergy that you get inside is very very rare 
the people have allergy to metal on the skin does not mean that they're going to have allergy inside. The commonest metal that the, we use is chromium cobalt, which is an impurity with nickel, cadmium, and that is what causes the allergy most of the time, nickel. Uh, are there any ways of testing them? There are, but they are not foolproof. We don't have it here. Um, uh, the Ames in Delhi does that. But the problem is that at the end of that also, they will say that there is a likelihood or no likelihood. It's not 100%. The only 100% is that you make a cut, put the metal inside, take a biopsy after three months or six months. But that's, that's a long route. And it is so rare that we don't generally check. However, in some of the patients who do have too much of nickel uh, allergy with the ornaments or the glasses or whatever, then we can use alternate material, which is the ceramics. Now, ceramics are good from the allergy point of view. It's a metal covered with the uh, ceramic layer. But they are brittle. Ceramics are not as strong as the metal. They are brittle. So there is a give and take. I generally don't want to advocate ceramic joint in every patient for various reasons. However, in such patient where allergy is there, we tend to use ceramic joints. Okay? Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I think uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, yeah, before we go, we would like to present him with a memento from our side. Sir, I don't know whether you like this or not, but I hope you do. Beautiful color. <laughs> yeah, switch. Answer for you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, not at all. I hope you like the format. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, if possible, have tea with us. Some people might want to have more queries. Uh, 15 minutes, please. Uh, be back soon.
uh, all the delegates who had to give away their tickets because they were participating in the second round, can we please call them upstage? Dr. Rathod, Dr. Rashmi, Abhite, Aye, sir, please come. Dr. Lina Jariwala was there. Bagadia, Dr. Lina Bagadia was there. And who did you say? Dr. Subhar Gajriya, you can please come up. Sir, please take, take a seat here. And give me all the answers, uh, bingos that have been said so far, so that I can give them. I'm going to announce that. Uh, Anyone who is collecting new bingo tickets, feel free to check and answer. Yeah, yeah, you can take Dr. Devish. So I'll quickly run through what answers have come and you can check if you have missed any or if you are picking up the bingo tickets right now. SIBO, S-I-B-O, SIBO. Next one is E-S-A. Then more than eight centimeters. Gas under. Molluscum, INT, no. What is, is D1? D1 kya hai? D1, into susception. Okay. INT. So it will say INT. Carbuncle, pneumothorax, endo, charcoal, SGOT, levo, transferrin, HFMD, right dome, then short abbreviation for erythema nodosum, that is EN, there is moxie, homylase, mupirocin, yeah, so travelers I, I, diarrhea, travelers Trav diarrhea, diarrhea. So diarrhea. diarrhea. Yeah. thank you. HFN, and foot mouth, HFM. Uh, a few uh, announcements before we go. 19th of November, post Diwali Sunday, we are having a uh, geriatrics four hour solo session at uh, uh, Jamna Bai Nursery School. Uh, we are specially flying in a very accomplished uh, geriatrician from CMC Velour and uh, she has agreed to come on actually the previous day and uh, Dr. Ganesh and she will be uh, shooting some videos for us uh, with me and her, uh, interviewing her on Saturday and Sunday will be the dedicated lecture. Uh, so please do attend if you are interested in geriatrics and if you are not back from your, if you are back from your vacation, uh, do come. Uh, this will be the only function till the next year. Uh, in December, no teaching at all, except in Flame University at 27th to 30th four days session, where we keep often once in three months. There are very many Flame regulars, Flame University is near Pune, that is a paid program because we pay Flame University about 5,000 for the two nights. <coughs> so do come for that if anybody is welcome there. We do internal medicine, uh, various subjects there. So if, if this, if we get sizable registrations, we will probably do that program also. And then January is a very, very busy month. And as you know, uh, January uh, 6th and 7th, we have the GPA conference. Dr. Sunita, would you like to push GPA once more? You announce that? <laughs> it's not about paying attention, it's about, about paying money. <laughs> okay.
So please uh, do register. I think it's going to be a very exciting uh, conference. Very good speakers. And uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to introduce the PI team to all of you before we go ahead with the big go. Uh, Dr. Snehal, Lajja, Dr. Seema, Tanvi, please come up on stage. We don't have Omkar here. We don't have Suraj here. Meena, Minita, Suraj, Suraj. Kruti. Kruti not there, right? Kruti is also not there. Okay, just very brief introduction about Pi Pi platform for intelligent entertainment. We started life in 2013, I think, and we are 10, 11 years old. And uh, our object was to teach and empower family physicians as the first principal objective. And uh, we try to do it through slightly more than just humdrum, humdrum mundane activities. Uh, our team consists of, we'll uh, call them one by Dr. Tushar Maniar, pediatrician, head of department of Nanavati Hospital. His very, very much better half, Seema Maniar. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, Lajja, my very much better and tolerant half, Lajja Shah. Uh, Snehal has been a core member of PI. Snehal is a homeopaths consultant. And uh, uh, she is the, I would say she is the backbone of PI. Very, very pushy, very, very I mean, harassment to another level. If I don't do something correct, but she's great. Her husband is Omkar Halwai, who some of you know is an END specialist. And, uh, and of course, Tanvi Shah is my daughter. And uh, she's a theater maker. She's a theater director, theater maker. And her special, uh, speciality is events. Uh, especially dramatics. So, and she's currently at our official photographer. Uh, and uh, we have also Minita uh, Killawala. Minita is my niece and also the chartered accountant and the chief, uh, uh, what do they call it? Controller. Chief controller of everything uh, in our team. And Suraj, who's not here, Dr. Suraj Dhirwani is our technical uh, person, chief technical officer. And uh, he's giving some MBA exams and therefore, his proxy is uh, Dr. Rachita. Rachita, please take a bow. Dr. Rachita, she's, uh, she's done all the legwork, handwork, brain work for all of this. And yeah, so uh, have I missed somebody? Scor uh, scorer, uh, scorers. Kruti, of course, Kruti is Dirwani, Suraj Dirwani's wife. And again, uh, she's a nutritionist, a very, very good nutritionist. And, uh, and yeah. all the volunteers, who come oh, here yeah. every my, my, time, my every single time who are sitting and help there. us out. A lot of them are sitting here. Shweta is uh, here. There is Moina. There is uh, Rachna. There is Kurti. There is, of course, Rachita was there. And somebody who's come, uh, Anuja from Holland. Uh, and there is uh, Dyuti, who's working with me since a few weeks. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much. And we will um, keep taking your patience uh, by, <laughs> by the... <laughs> By the horns. Thank you. <laughs> oh, those, uh, I've told you that before again and again, but nothing is possible. No academics is possible. I will just give you a small example. Four hours, four hours, four hours, 12 hours of teaching in these three Sundays. Uh, 50 questions. For example, 50 questions were to be said today. 50 questions. And we have on our phone a bank of about 600 questions just for today of which we have selected 50 questions, and they have done all the legwork, all, all the homework, and uh, for two line answers, we have one full page of information. So, uh, and as they tell me, they keep telling me the teacher has to know more than the student, so we keep learning more than all of you even learn. So that is, big hand, Kumar, and Mukesh is here. Also, I have to just felicitate, uh, two more people. Yeah. You, I don't know, if all of you saw the video, Dr. Shantaram Shetty, our in-house yoga teacher. Is Dr. Shantaram Shetty here? Yeah. Sir, please come here. Shantaram Shetty gracefully agreed at a moment's notice to come over to my hospital and in the garden of the hospital. He shot the videos, uh, which were again very well edited. And uh, Shantaram Shetty has been a regular at Flame University. And at Flame University, in the beautiful gardens or lawns of Flame, he makes us do yoga. 
uh, absolutely brilliant uh, and sir i am so sorry that you find this embarrassing i know but thank you so much <laughs> and if you can uh, our uh, your student was kunal kunal please give this to him if you can thank, thank you so much kunal was the guy who was in the videos okay so much for the thanks uh yeah rashita anything else uh, so there is a gpa conference on 6th and 7th i wanted to again tell you that the gpa conference uh, of course is a brilliant uh, full day conference i'll i'll she said too much about my involvement my involvement is one lecture uh, i'll be giving one lecture on on the subject that i don't know yet <laughs> that is my only uh, edutainment but otherwise i think they are doing very hard work and i, I appreciate that and you should kind of uh, appreciate their efforts by attending okay uh i think also uh, sorry i'm um, this thank thing is a long thing but where does this money come from part of the money of course comes from your contribution that you give so gracefully but we get a good amount of money from three very important donors to us and all three luckily are from the stock market <laughs> and luckily <laughs> the stock market is doing well <laughs> so so keep buying stocks keep the stock market up <laughs> my investors are uh, and and they are they were given they have given us a free hand at finances they know that we won't spend uh, wastefully but they have given us a free hand and flame university which is owned by a stock person stock market person nimish shah they give us those who come to flame know they give us at pittance the five stars facilities at flame university so all this is happening because of the stock market okay uh yeah we'll start the uh, game there Sir? is a request for some humor and some kavita main ek do minute pe lunga team a team a your turn can you please tell me the choice it's a good idea to keep your choice ready so we save time on that b2 b2 is a new category this is a category of repurposed drugs we know that what happened in uh, in uh, covid many drugs were repurposed for something else first and for covid now this is repurposed drugs outside of covid your first one b2 please Finasteride is a drug principally used in benign prostatic hypertrophy or hyperplasia as they call it what is the repurposed approved indication of finasteride can you be very specific please hair loss male pattern male pattern hair loss is the correct answer 5 points to team a uh, which is the only drug approved by us second question us fda for female pattern hair loss only drug approved oral sir oral or topical nahi only one drug is approved you tell me which drug minoxidil sir minoxidil is the correct answer topical minoxidil is the only approved drug for female pattern so lot of drugs are used off label including bi biotin your question which b is biotin b3 b4 b5 b6 your audience question B seven, biotin is B seven. Okay, okay. So that is ten points to team A. The word is finasteride. Your your question, please. E four skin. E four skin. Is it with you? No, it's with you. This is easy skin. We have sorry. Lights come करना है. Okay. लाइट थोड़ा डिम करेंगे ऊपर का स्टेज का आइडेंटिफाई द स्किन डिजीज स्किन लीजन एकेंथोसिस नाइग्रिकेंस स्किन लीजन्स या एकेंथोसिस नाइग्रिकेंस फाइव पॉइंट्स वेल डन एंड डॉक्टर सुनीता इज द ओनली पर्सन क्लैपिंग सो वी शुड हेल्प हर एड हर ओके योर क्वेश्चन नंबर टू देर आर टू डिसऑर्डर्स कॉमनली कंपनीड बाई एकेंथोसिस one is diabetes mellitus which is the other lifestyle disorder which is the other lifestyle disorder associated Met with metabolic syndrome anybody else 
obesity. Obesity is associated with this. Zero points to team A, uh, team B here. Uh, audience question, difficult question. Which metastatic cancer is associated with acanthosis nigricans as a paraneoplastic syndrome? If you see a thin person with acanthosis who is non-diabetic, meaning no obesity, no diabetes, you must think of a paraneoplastic syndrome in association with gastric carcinoma. Yeah. Acanthosis can occur with GI cancers, including gastric carcinoma. Okay, team A. Zero points, word. bingo word. Okay, second line claimed. Bingo word kya hai? Acanthosis nigricans. Please, uh, middle line, please uh, tell us your words. Wonderful. Uh, your your uh, middle line is done. Your name, sir? Ashok ji ke liye zordar taliya. We have blood pressure instruments provided by the health store who you met outside, some of you. And uh, all of all the prizes are again sponsored by the health store. So thank you, health store. He's probably there somewhere. Thank you, Sidhubai. Uh, oh, I'm going to take his help again during the geriatrics lecture because there are so many geriatric related equipment that he has and that we don't know about. Uh, we, we should learn those areas. Okay, team A. E2. E2 is Dermatology, identify this skin disease. Easy question. Scabies. Scabies is the correct answer. Five points for scabies. What is the adult dose of oral ivermectin in duration and microgram per kg body weight? Adult dose of ivermectin. Make a guess. So 12 milligrams, sir? 12 milligrams is not per kg. So no, give me a... Do, is that just the dose? Uh, but I want the microgram per kg because that is important in this disease. Correct, go ahead. Divided by six. Yeah, so yeah, she said, yeah, you're right. If you know so your math, you're right. <laughs> Help her, 12 milligrams, uh, single dose, point, divided by 60 uh, kg. 0.6 uh, uh, micrograms per kg body. <laughs> no, it's, it's just a match mistake. 200. Uh, we'll 200. give it to them. We'll give it 200 to microgram them. per kg body weight, which in a 60 kg person becomes 12 milligram. The reason why it is important here to know the dose is that the range is 200 to 400. We often end up giving 12 milligrams to a heavy set body, like 80 kg person. We can, cannot do that. We have to give 200 micrograms per kg. And children also similarly. Th we do use only 200 micrograms same dose, per kilogram. So, so in a 30 kg child, for example, you will need to give 6 milligrams, etc. Okay, to the audience, the... Bingo word, scabies. Scabies. First line and third line simultaneously. Two minutes back, I ask one question. After that, you both. Audience question. Uh, for scabies, we use a local application also called permethrin. How many percent? What percent permethrin? Five percent. And for head lice, what percent? One percent. One percent. Correct. So brand names, for example, are per mite for the mite that is scabies and per lice for the head. So if you don't remember the percentage, remember the brand that goes with the each, each of the infections. Uh, uh, so top line, who's top line? Please uh, announce your words in top line. Moxidine. Levofloxacin. SIBO. Trans. Trans. Perfect. Uh, Ma'am, you have top line? Tell me. Is it diarrhea? Bola, second? Diarrhea is diarrhea. Diarrhea. So both of them, same price, please. And bottom line? Third line, please tell us. Carbuncle. 
सेकंड क्या था ईएसए ईएसए ना कहते हैं सिस्टम ओके सो स्केबीज नहीं था सो आइडियली वी शुड हैव द लास्ट वर्ड स्पोकन शुड बी इन द बिंगो टिकट बट दिस इज नॉट अ प्रोफेशनल बिंगो गेम सो प्लीज गिव अवर प्राइस ओके एनीबडी कैन टेल मी व्हाट इज नॉर्वेजियन स्केबीज एब्सोल्युट ब्रिलियंट सो एनी इम्यूनो कॉम्प्रोमाइज पेशेंट इफ यू सी फ्लोरिड स्केबीज इट्स लेबल्ड एज नॉर्वेजियन नॉर्वेजियन स्केबीज टीम बी बी वन सर बी वन नाउ दिस इज अ न्यू कैटेगरी वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट मेजर मेडिकल ट्रायल्स ट्रायल्स दैट हैव चेंज्ड प्रिस्क्रिप्शंस बाय अस राइट सो दिस ट्रायल द क्वेश्चन इज दिस द ट्रायल इज कॉल्ड एस्प्री ट्रायल इज पब्लिश्ड इन 2018 इट शोड दैट अ ड्रग taken by 1000 persons over 5 years caused 2.5 fewer ischemic strokes and mi but 3.5 more cases of intracranial hemorrhage a drug given for 5 years what was the drug aspirin, aspirin simple answer aspirin is the new trial low dose aspirin this was a trial for primary prophylaxis in patients who did not have any disease or risk Uh, still given aspirin they found that aspirin causes more harm than benefit which is why uh, people have in india at least stopped giving primary prophylaxis in america where the research was done they still take aspirin 2022 second question 2022 us guidelines by the us preventive task force recommend aspirin for primary prophylaxis in adults with more than 10% calculated 10 year cardiovascular risk of only a certain age group what age group you want me to repeat yes. one particular age group is now recommended primary prophylaxis with aspirin only if they have more than 10% 10 year risk score which age group is advised 45 to 75 age group incorrect anybody 40 to 59 is the correct answer 40 to 59 is the answer uh, this is this is an important uh, area please recommend is keep changing i i'm not still prescribing 40 to 59 but still these uh, things will keep changing yeah yeah so there are sub categories within this this is just a broader question yes team yeah. a they 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 got zero bingo word was aspirin aspirin was the bingo word d4 no b for bombay b4 repurposed drug can we have the drug name please tadalafil the principal use of tadalafil was erectile dysfunction repurposed for what other important use which is non pulmonary please repurposed for a non pulmonary use erectile dysfunction erectile dysfunction was the principal use what is the repurposed second use the whole point is this main use researched use erectile dysfunction make a guess time up overactive bladder overactive bladder is incorrect anybody knows benign prostatic hypertrophy very important to learn this at our level family physician level many patients will not tolerate tamsulosin or psilocybin or what is the third drug alfuzosin wo dustbin mein gaya na tab se yaad nahi aata these three alpha blockers are sometimes not tolerated because of postural hypotension or retrograde ejaculation therefore many patients will need to be taking an alternative for frequency hesitancy etc the prostatic symptoms tadalafil is a good drug given alone instead of the alpha blockers as a symptom relieving drug dose is 5 mg every day for long term okay second question you did not get one but you can get a uh, zero if you answer this question 
while blue vision is more common with sildenafil than with tadalafil which side effect is more with tadalafil and less with sildenafil postural hypotension no no anybody retrograde sorry 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 no retrograde rapism nahi good guess but no very good myalgias body ache is a less a common side myalgias is a very peculiar side effect at all feel not with this okay so minus 5 here minus 5 to team a your turn d8 d8 d, d for delhi 8 spot diagnosis can you see the image your question is this usg picture shows one of the three criteria for diagnosing which condition PCOS. PCOS is correct. PCOS, one of the criteria, the three criteria, of course, uh, you will have to tell us. W one criterion is cysts, multiple cysts in the ovary. What are the other two criteria? Your Regular second question. Periods. No, just un inside the other. Regular periods and uh, uh, irregular periods, obesity, acne. No, no, no. Criteria for diagnosing are only three. Uh, Specific. Uh, insulin. Uh, शीला PCOS. So, uh, three criteria: androgen excess, which will be manifested as hirsutism or blood tests, like testosterone, dia, etc., showing the androgen excess. And the other is ovulatory dysfunction, manifesting as oligomenorrhea, ultimately infertility, also. And uh, yeah, so these are the three features, and two out of three. Are required, and question on to the audience is: These three criteria are named after a city in Netherlands. Netherlands, which criteria? Rotterdam's criteria. Wonderful. Okay. Ah, uh, so that is about. Yeah. Team B. Uh, you Sorry, have got the clue. Team A. Team A. The word. PCOS, and they got what? Zero. Okay. the word before this was tadalafil for your answers just team a it's 12:45 we need to leave at 1:30 hmm. india has lost the toss and is batting first c4 c4 aapke paas hai this girl with short stature has this finding which is shown with a which has been calibrated over here what condition are you looking at short stature with girl with short stature with this some hint one year make it easier who will present as primary amenorrhea in adolescence short Time stature up. with girls yeah okay i'll ask you the next question which other classical abnormality you are able to see web, web neck web yeah so we are talking about turner syndrome turner syndrome and that's what she was actually pointing at the web neck which is also seen over here so we'll give them zero only turner, turner. so 5 plus 5 minus so you said turner yeah. i thought you were saying downs yeah, she said okay turns. then okay. 10 points we give them. you 10 points liberals liberals we are liberals have the kya tumhe bolo shu jo hai aap khali batao kya chahiye turner is the bingo word uh, we have as you know we have full house left we have how many gifts left nahi nahi yahan to six jayega to ek hi full house full house ek hi ek hi full house do nahi hai और एक साथ जाकर तीन चार जन ने दिया तो हमारे पास बहुत सारे टाइप ब्रेकिंग क्वेश्चन है ओके या 
which one? Sir, A2. A2. A2, A2 new terminology, very uh, easy. Okay, can we have the terminology? Primary hypertension is the new term for which old term? In the mic, essential, essential hypertension. What we used to call essential hypertension is now being called primary hypertension because why? Because we know that this is not an essential thing to have. <laughs> okay, your question. In most cases, we wait if the patient has 160, 100. We wait for a second reading, etc. In which situation, 160, 100 can be the only reading for you to start the medication? Which situation? Pregnancy. Huh? Pregnancy. Pregnancy. No. One reading, you will not start in pregnancy also. Anybody? Target, target organ damage. The most important thing is if the patient presents with ECG showing left ventricular hypertrophy, 2D echo showing left ventricular hypertrophy, eye showing retinopathy, kidney showing proteinuria or high creatinine, LVF, target organ damage in a one reading patient will be enough. So in pediatrics, we work the other way around. If we encounter hypertension, we first rule out target organ damage or target organ affection and then try to label it as essential or now primary hypertension. Correct. Uh, one thing we, I don't know whether you can see that the pediatric questions are facing greater difficulty by the uh, participants and by maybe you also. And why is this? Why is this? Not seen too many pediatric patients. You have given it to them and then you also blame them. They have taken it from us. <laughs> So my request is to you that it is not, pediatrics is not difficult. I think it is not difficult. And we are easier than adult medicine. It is. And it is. So you must take it back from them. And we are very happy to hand it over to you. Yeah. The bingo word was primary hypertension, PHT. Okay. Yeah, that next. is, next please. A4. They said A4. New term. New terminology for easy. What is the new term for this? Diastolic heart failure. Uh, Diastolic he heart failure. Heart failure with uh, preserved rejection fraction. H F P E F. Hef Pef. Heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. Why did they need to change the term? I don't know, so I won't ask you. <laughs> Diastolic heart failure basically means that the heart systolic function is good. Its filling pressures are high because of, say, left ventricular hypertrophy. Therefore, there is back pressure, and therefore the heart, uh, there is congestion, congestive cardiac failure. That is now called hef pef Your second question, what fe feature on a 2D echo in a heart failure patient goes against the diagnosis of hef pef Echo mein kya dikhega to tum bolega ye hef pef nahi hai. Heart failure ka patient hai. Echo mein kya dikhega? So you say, what about ejection fraction? Dysolic dysfunction. Uh, uh, she's on the right track. What ejection fraction will rule out hef What ejection fraction won't you diagnose hef with? hef is? Preserved rejection fraction. 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 Will not be half pep. Sorry? 60% less than 50. 50 is the correct answer. Less than 50% will not be called half pep. Get 10 marks. 10 marks for them. Uh, Team B. Very quickly, mm. geriatrics uh, population, but I There are three risk factors of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Three risk factors long standing hypertension, obesity, and age. All these three. Many of us have many, at least two of the three, age, obesity, hi hypertension. hef -pef is becoming a more and more common cause of heart failure and therefore diffi difficult to recognize because the ejection fraction is normal. The presentation is not standard. So you, in any patient who comes with dyspnea on exertion or edema feet, and the patient fits these three criteria of age, hypertension, and uh, obesity, 
please think of FPF. You have to do an echo. You may have to do an NT pro BNP, and then of course refer. Okay, next. Bingo word is DHF, diastolic heart failure. Next, please. Trials are easy. B3. B3. Trials. What is this trial called? Emperor Reduced Trial, published in 2020. A drug was found superior to placebo in improving outcome, outcome of HEFREF, that is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, irrespective of diabetes. Which drug are we talking about? Empagliflozin. Empagliflozin. Empa for emperor. Empagliflozin. So again, uh, very quickly, three SGLT2 inhibitors available, right? First, I'll ask the second question before I forget. Invocana is not approved for heart failure. SGLT2 inhibitor. What is Invocana? Cardiac fluxation. Slight. Slight, slight. Thoda sa? Cardiac fluxation. Okay, I, I will give it to them. What is the name? I will give it to you. Canagliflozin. Canagliflozin is Invocana brand name. There are three SGLT2 inhibitors. We are, we have to strengthen our SGLT2 inhibitor knowledge. Right? Very important. Empagliflozin, Canagliflozin, Dapagliflozin, and the fourth one, Indian one, Remogliflozin, which is dustbin. So three SGLT2 we have. These three are SGLT2, we should know well. But canagliflozin, I'm glad Gajar Sahib did not pronounce it correctly because that also belongs to the dustbin. We have two SGLT2, EMPA and DAPA. EMPA and DAPA are very important for you to practice. One important thing is they are good diabetes drugs. Of course, they cause fungal infections uh, at the interoitus, etc. But also, they are useful in protecting the kidney and protecting the heart. In fact, such that in CKD now, without diabetes, if the patient has a, a, a GFR of even up to 20, it is to be given even if there is no diabetes. Similarly, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, diabetes is not necessary for you to give uh, uh, these two drugs as a benefit. In, in HEF, PEF, preserved ejection fraction, there is some controversy, but they have been approved in HEF-PEF also, where I have my doubts. But I'm just telling you that these two are important drugs which will be seen in non-diabetic patients more and more frequently. Okay, so that is, next please. You had 10 points there. Emperor is the bingo word. For empagliflozin, emperor. C7, sir. C7, C7, C7. Mixed bag, moderately tough. Your first question. <coughs> Which injectable drug given to children for enteric fever may cause gallbladder sludge? Which injectable drug given for enteric, in children especially, may cause gallbladder sludge? What is the drug of choice for enteric? Cephal. Injectable. Let them, let them answer. No, no. Don't prompt. Galat, galat to nahi karna. Injectable. Which injectable drug? Ceftriaxone, sir. Ceftriaxone is the correct answer. Ten points for Ceftriaxone. And Talia. Our second question. After which surgery is ursodeoxycholic acid, UDCA given to prevent sludge or stone formation. After which surgery is UDCA given to prevent stone and sludge formation? Guess, guess, guess. Guess will be right. CBD stone removal. No. After bariatric surgery. After bariatric surgery. You know that any intense weight loss in an obese person 
can increase the chance of sludge and stone formation. So bariatric surgery ke baad, it is not uncommon to get sludge and stone. So any bariatric surgery patient, one has to consider giving for some duration UDCA. Similarly, patients who are intermittent fasting or on a keto diet or are on uh, mass common of pollution per, uh, level or on, you must think of probably suspecting if they come with abdominal pain. Okay. Anybody uh, who can tell me who, which physiologic condition is, uh, the, is the cause of gallbladder sludge? Pregnancy. Pregnancy can cause gallbladder sludge. Yeah. The word, the word is sludge. Thank you. Who uh, is round Meat pies. Meat pies. Meat pies. Major trials. They are trial experts. <laughs> the trial is called Improve It. This was a trial which established utility of an add-on drug to prevent progression of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Which drug? Add-on drug for preventing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Like, you know, statins prevent ASCVD. This was an add-on drug proven to improve that. Yes. Ezetimibe is the correct answer. 10 points to team A. Ezetimibe was part of the improvement trial. And next question. Brillo EZ contains two drugs. One is Ezetimibe. What is the other drug? Bempedoic acid. Bempedoic acid is correct. 10 points to you. Well done. Uh, 20 points. So this was moderate and 20 points. Very quickly, some uh, messages here. Ezetimibe. We are not very familiar with using it at general practitioner level. But it's a very good drug to use because of two reasons. It improves the LDL levels when given in combination with statins. And you can, by adding acetamide, lower the dose of statin so that side effects of statins are less. Many patients will be discharged on 40 milligrams of rosuva statin after a myoclonic infarction. Continue that 40 milligram for some time. But remember that 20 milligram rosuva statin with an added 10 milligram of acetamide will work as well for lowering LDL cholesterol. So you can consider, especially if patients develop muscle pains, consider reducing the statin, adding acetamide. Combinations are available of uh, Atrova and uh, rosuva statin with acetamide. You can give acetamide separately. The brand name is EZDOC, EZDOC. 10 milligram. So you can play around with those. Bempedoic acid is a new drug in the LDL lowering market. I'm not yet very familiar with the usage of the drug. I've not used it much. 180 milligram once a day is the dose of bempedoic acid, typically used in patients who are intolerant to statins. You can use it. Uh, bempedoic acid is also combined with acetamide, which I don't think is approved in the US at least. Uh, bempedoic acid causes two main side effects. High uric acid, gout and gallbladder stones. So that you can keep in mind. The word is improve and the scores are? Team A 35, Team B 30. Team A 35, Team B 30. Uh, before we break, for, there's still some time. Uh, and also I would like to tell you, uh, tell you two things. My daughter Tanvi will be in the auditorium premises to take some testimonials. So if some, some of you would like to comment upon the three Sundays, uh, please meet Tanvi. And uh, there is a small donation box. If you feel, you can keep it here. Uh, we also have a <coughs> link on, the, on our group. Also, don't leave the group because uh, this is the best group I've had in, on WhatsApp. 1,000 people never had such a group. So don't leave the group because announcements, events keep on happening through Pi. Also, we will be posting Sorry? some teaching material, learning matter, etc. We will keep posting on that. So there is no main group. There are some groups which are differently themed. I will just tell you about that. There is a group called Harfan Mola, where there are only people who have done medic maestro, sorry, armamentarium as our program. We have a program which you have attended, sir, in South Bombay, armamentarium. All those who have not attended armamentarium, Please direct me, directly message me. Many people have requested, I want to learn hypertension, I want to learn diabetes, etc., etc. We teach everything in pharmacotherapy, outpatient, in armamentarium. 
over three Sundays, full Sundays, nine to four. And this will keep happening. So those who would like to attend, this is a kind of a crash course which is extremely palatable. You can come and attend whenever it is happening. Those who have attended and want to come again are welcome. This is a free course. So armamentarium, if you have not attended, would like to attend, I can at least make up. This is in a batches of 24 people usually, though we make larger batches also. So and so Harfan Mola is only those people who attended armamentarium. Then there is musketeers, a more general batch where people post their queries. It's called 200 musketeers. All are invited to join that. And I think this batch that we have now of SOS 2023 registrations, I think we'll make it a, an important batch for ongoing teaching. Any other suggestions, please give me after the session is over. 35 points versus 30 points. We have 15 more minutes. Uh, team A. Anybody knows about the toss? A6. <laughs> Kamlesh bhai? Ah. 130 ko toss hai. A6. No, no, you can't do it. A6, A6. Classic A6. migraine. New terminology. The word is classic migraine. What is the new term for classic migraine? Auras. Migraine with aura is the correct answer. Talia or five or uh, ten points because it's a moderate question. Migraine with twenty percent of all migraine is with aura. So migraine with aura. Your term. What 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 is the term used for visual aura that resembles the walls of a medieval fort? Old time fort ka jo walls hota hai na? Usme aisa 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 hota hai walls. Waisa hi ek. What is the name given? Scintillating scotoma alag hota hai. Usme wo black hole hota hai With shining around. But ye, ye alag hai. Scotoma is a black spot. Okay. Fortification spectra. Fortification spectra are, you know, fort ke aaj aap, ऐसा 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 फोर्टिफिकेशन होता है हां फिर बीच में एक मोट होता है पानी का मोट होता है तो वो फोर्टिफिकेशन स्पेक्ट्रा जैसा ऑरा दिखता है द कॉमनेस्ट ऑरा आर विजुअल एंड विद इन विजुअल देयर आर पॉजिटिव ऑरा नेगेटिव ऑरा नेगेटिव ऑरा लाइक स्कोटोमा सिंटिलेटिंग स्कोटोमा बोलते हैं एंड एक होता है पॉजिटिव ऑरा जिसको फोर्टिफिकेशन स्पेक्ट्रा बोलते हैं टू मिस्टेक्स हैपेंड विद फैमिली फिजिशियंस इन आई सिम्टम्स रिलेटेड uh, to migraine and stroke. Just very briefly, if a patient comes to you with blurring of vision, sudden onset, you will send first to the ophthalmologist. And the ophthalmologist will invariably send the patient back to you. That I can't see anything in the retina, kuch nahi. Do remember, curtain falling in front of the eye is amaurosis fugax, which is a lesion of the internal carotid artery sending emboli to the retinal artery. Amorosis fugax, you should diagnose this and immediately refer to a neurologist who will do an MR angiography and diagnose. The other is this, migraine. Migraine will often come with a retinal variant called uh, retinal migraine, which is sudden blindness. Sudden blindness, which goes away. Always ask if this has happened before. Sudden blindness, which goes away. Or scotomas. Or, or these auras. Sometimes auras can occur without headache. So again, you'll be tempted to send the patient to an ophthalmologist. You can do an ophthalm checkup, but remember that this will come back to you and you'll have to make a correct diagnosis. Okay. Also in pediatrics, if you see a child with headache, once you have ruled out all the intracranial or acute problems, do think of migraine, but go into details of family history of migraine. Do not diagnose migraine in children without a family history of migraine or migraine variant. That's very important. Okay, next, Abka. B7. B7 major trials again. And this trial is called the Freedom Trial. Freedom Trial of 2009 publication showed the benefit of a drug administered subcutaneously every six months for 36 months for benefit. What benefit, I can't tell you. And what drug? Administered subcute every six months for 36 months. This is moderately difficult, so no more hints. In the mic, 
Denosumab? Denosumab is correct. Denosumab is well done. Denosumab is beneficial for? Porosis, osteoporosis. Your second question. What is the milligram? One of the brands available here is Prolia. Prolia. What is the milligram dose every six months? Approximately. Approximately. Milligram dose. 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is incorrect. 60 milligrams is the correct dose. And the cost is approximately 17,000. So no marks here. No marks there. And Apka. One right, one wrong. The trial is true. Freedom. The trial name, Freedom. E7. E7, E7. E7 Apka. is with me. Sorry. So you can see this skin condition over here. It's a cafe only spot. How many of such lesions you require to see in a one year old child that would make you think that it is high risk for neurofibromatosis one? I want a number. How many more? How many do you need? You can make a guess. Seven to eight. The actual answer is six. Six and above. Six and above. Six and above. So yeah, I know. Seven and eight is very close to six and above. <laughs> <laughs> Which benign intracranial tumor is related to NF2, neurofibromatosis 2, close to a temporal bone? You ask for a CT temporal bone for that. Okay, time up. Audience? Acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma. Or vestibular schwannoma. Acoustic neuroma should be diagnosed by you when it comes, if it comes, rarely comes. Deafness, tinnitus. Two main symptoms. Deafness, tinnitus. They may have vertigo. But if a person comes with unilateral deafness and tinnitus, look for corneal reflex. Corneal reflex absent, acoustic neuroma. Uh, MRI, of course, will diagnose. Next. For cafeole spots to be abnormal, it's important to know that in small children, each one has to be, the ones that you count, has to be more than 0.5 centimeters. And if it's a post-pubertal patient, that means adults or adolescent post-pubertal, each lesion should be more than 1.5 centimeter for you to count the numbers. Mm -hmm. The bingo word was C-A-L, Cafe Ole. Cal, Cal. Okay, next. We are now. A8, sir. A8. A8. <laughs> A8. This is new terminology. new terminology. What is shown here? HIV positive person. It is now considered politically incorrect to call somebody HIV positive. What is the correct term? Immunocompromised. There are so many immunocompromised. Uh, living with HIV. Li <laughs> <laughs> living with HIV. Person living with HIV is the term used for person who uh, is infected. So that is your chance to redeem yourself. While post-exposure prophylaxis after a needle stick injury from an HIV person, person with living with HIV, can be useful up to 72 hours. What is the ideal time within which you should take the first dose of post-exposure prophylaxis medicine? 72 hours. 72 hours tak hai. Lekin ideally 72 hours nahin. 24 to 72 hours. 24 to 72? Anybody? Two six, hours. Six. If you get a needle stick, if you're not sure what is the uh, needle stick from, two hours you should take your first dose. Tri yeah, those are tri it's a triple drug combination typically. So, uska ek dose it comes as a fixed uh, drug combination. So, living with HIV? Ka living bonus with HIV. Ka bonus milega. Kya? Bingo mein kya? HIV. HIV. So, your question. B6. B6, repurposed drugs. Your drug is bupropion. Bupropion principally 
uh, given for depression. Piperoprion and a combination with naltrexone given for weight loss. What is bupropion alone also given for? A de uh, smoking direction. Smoking cessation is correct. 10 points for smoking cessation. Second question. Nicotine patches are often used for smoking cessation. Why do some people prefer to remove the patch, which is a 24-hour patch, why do they prefer to remove the patch at bedtime? Some people would like to remove it at bedtime. I'll give it to you. Is it dreams? It is vivid dreams. They get very, very vivid dreams, which may be nightmarish or may uh, unusually pleasant. Like I had a patient 20. who got Deepika Padukone every day in his dream. <laughs> and why did he remove it? Because he, he, she would come with Ranbir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll go there. Bingo, what is? Bupropion. Bupropion. So we are still waiting for the full house. Okay. We have the scores after this round. E ten. E ten. मेरे पास है डरमेट है. E ten should be okay. This is tough, right? This is therefore for fifteen points per question. This skin lesion was seen in a patient who presented also with iron deficiency anemia. So which skin lesion would correlate well? with iron deficiency anemia. What is this extremely prorytic skin lesion? It occurs, I'll give you a hint here, it occurs with a chronic GI disease. Plumber Wilson's. Plumber Wilson's is incorrect, which also has iron deficiency role. But Plumber Wilson does not have a characteristic rash. Anybody? Yes. Celiac sprue and this is called? This is an important thing that you cannot not know. Dermatitis herpetiformis is a skin disease that often accompanies celiac sprue. Mm -hmm. Dermatitis herpetiformis is uncommon but not completely rare. And we'll keep treating it with symptomatic drugs when it is considered a extremely controllable disorder with one drug called Dapsone. Okay. Uh, what is the principal side effect of Dap? Second question. Which is the principal side effect of Dapsone which causes hypoxia? Acute side effect, not a chronic side effect. Methemoglobinemia? It's correct. Methemoglobinemia, 10. Uh, Otalia, they saved their points. Uh, so yeah, meth hemo Dapsone is the drug of choice for dermatitis herpetiformis. You also have to look for uh, celiac spree, uh, sprue, do G6 spree before giving Dapsone. And methemoglobin of Dapsone is treated with what? Methylene blue, right? So all G6 PD related drugs should be avoided categorically in pregnant women because you do not know the status of G6PD in the fetus wow. and then you can land up with uh, hemolysis and eye drops in in, in, uh, up in the fetus. Okay. Dermatitis is the bingo word. Anybody one away from the only one person there is and one more person one away three people uh, one away from the Rasal Kasab. Okay. Uh, bingo ho jaye uske pehle ek kavita pesh karta hu uh, ye kavita ka pehla shair likha hai fehmi badayuni naam ke shair ne aur uh, unhone likha hai romantic tarike se lekin hum pad sakte hain ophthalmic tarike se bhi to unka unka shair tha ki meri aankhon mein ye jo pani hai teri aankhon ki meherbani You can take it either way. Or then, his second share is written: 
कि डाइवर्जेंट स्क्विंट से पगला गया हूं डाइवर्जेंट स्क्विंट से पगला गया हूं दो लड़कियां मुझ पर दीवानी हैं और तीसरा शेर ये है कि ताजा है इसलिए याद नहीं रहती हाँ झुकी सी झुकी नजर उनकी शर्मो हया की निशानी है ना पता चला कि मैं की बीमारी है ऐसा कुछ तो नहीं सॉरी स्कोर्स प्लीज टीम ए फोर्टी फाइव टीम बी ट्वेंटी लॉर्ड ऑफ कैचिंग अपू डू वी हैव फाइव टेन जस्ट अंट हेयर फॉर बोथ द टीम्स इफ यू वॉन्ट टू डू दैचअप और यू डोंट वॉन्ट दैम टू कैचअप increase your risk profile that's the way your party works okay team a aapko kya chahiye aapka you are in lead so easy le sakte hain abhi tough tough moderate moderate hai nahi hai kuch moderate hai na ha moderate hai moderate boliye jaldi 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 b d c c c c c aapke paas hai okay c c one year old irritable child with fever for 5 days has these findings and no localization what is the likely diagnosis yeah name that a condition name the condition okay. you are there just think an answer k base correct kawasaki disease very good excellent wonderful kawasaki wonderful. disease so that if you see here as a bcg adenite bcg reactivation so bcg which was quiet becomes reactivated that is the only kawasaki is the only condition in which happens and it's a very simple clinical sign to pick up what abnormality on a 2d echo would be diagnostic of this disease you can use the mic on echo my what will you find which is diagnosed myocarditis that is incorrect i mean you can get myocarditis but that's not confirmed coronary artery dilatation. dilatation thrombosis or what we call ectasia to start with I mean they just become brighter on echo i think we'll skip the fsc okay so just, uh, no just score one, there one take home on this sorry is that any child any young kid if you see with fever without localization and rash on the body red eyes red tongue please send esr crp if they are high straight away ask for an echo and refer you will save lives thank you okay if you take a tough answer both questions you will lead them you have to be lenient ana ekdam lenient sab b9 b9 again trials for you this trial is called the courage trial a landmark trial that showed that doing angioplasty was no better than medical management optical optimum medical management even if significant lesions were present 70% or more lesions were present in the coronary arteries in a particular subset of symptomatic cad which subset are we talking about which clinical subset chronic stable angina excellent 15 points <laughs> chronic stable angina lesson full house okay there is just a minute chronic stable angina we have to learn this from courage trial because many cardiologists will open every vessel that is blocked right that is the rule it's a plumbing rule bolte hai na usko to apne ko dhyan rakhna hai if a patient is stable symptom no symptoms triple vessel disease or symptomatic but chronic stable angina has been stable for months together optimum medical therapy is equivalent to doing angioplasties okay very important and second question to you if you get that you lead them okay an important trial published in 2002 related to atrial fibrillation co compared two things in therapeutic Uh, aim of atrial fibrillation and found that the two things had no difference what did they compare in a trial for atrial fibrillation in 2002 they compared two 
parameters of therapy, two endpoints of therapy, and found that there was no difference between the two endpoints in terms of morbidity or mortality due to atrial fibrillation. What did they find which changed the therapy of atrial fibrillation forever? Trials between vitamin K antagonist and NOAX. No, that is incorrect. 2002 is far back. They found that controlling the rate and controlling the rhythm had no difference. Pehle apna kya tha ki shock deke normalize karo sinus karo ya amiodarone ya eptoin deke eptoin nahi sorry kya tha wo drug amiodarone is called drone. Uh, you regularize the rhythm with anti uh, arrhythmic drugs, but disopyramid was what I was trying to say. So we now know that just controlling the rate below 100 of atrial fibrillation related ventricular rate gives as much prognostic benefit as converting to sinus rhythm. So that was the trial that they showed. So no points there to you. And the I'll plus zero, they got zero. No, one right, one wrong. <laughs> No, no, one right, one wrong no, no. is plus, plus 15, 15 minus 15. Minus 15. So plus zero. 30 is both correct. In plus all 15. the categories, one right, one wrong is Haan. no mark. Devesh, answer, bolo na, fata fata. Courage and uske pehle Kawasaki. Bolo na, sir. Is correct? Devesh ke liye. Kaliya. Uh, the very fact that they have switched off the ACs, we have paid, on, paid only till 1 p.m. <laughs> and therefore, the ACs have been switched off. Uh, I think uh, we will declare the winners. Team A is the winner. <laughs> Can you give us the prizes, please? Team A won with 45 points. And Team B... Uh, again, testimonials in the auditorium if somebody is willing to stay back. Uh, if you are willing to stay back for uh, more uh, teaching, there's nobody here to teach you. <laughs> Go home and enjoy and thank you so much. Again, thank you very, very much.